This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee at 6.04 p.m. Um, and we'll take a roll call if you can, um, when I call your name, if you can um, say present so we know that you can hear us and we can hear you. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Not present. Um, and Mr. Menino. Not present. And uh, now uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, I call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee. And um, I'll call your name um, and if you can say present so that we know you can hear us. Um, Ms. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Mr. Demling. Demling still present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. And McDonald present. And now I'll turn it over to Sarah Hall. All right, thank you. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I will call to order the meeting of the Pelham School Committee. Um, Jesse. Jean Louis present. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard there. Sarah Bess. Uh, Sarah Bess, Kenny present. And Margaret. Stancer present. And Hall present. And Ron Menino is not here. Okay. Um, our first order of business is public comment. Um, and as of uh, shortly before this meeting, actually, um, we had received zero public comment. Um, and just reminding everybody that is watching from home, we always accept um, comments at our school committee at arps.org email address. And for public comment um, to be played at our meetings, we ask that you submit public comment by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting, either by um, email to myself, mcdonaldA at arps.org, or by phone um, to the Google number that's on our agendas. And now uh, turn it over to Dr. Morris for a superintendent's update. Sure. Um, unfortunately, I start with uh, more sad news um, that, that I do want to share with the committee. So um, this week we found out that a former student, uh, Felix Fonseca, who was a graduate of our school district, um, passed away. And so um, we've had an unfortunate set of, um, un of bad news in terms of uh, tragedies in our community. Uh, we have been, uh, there are family members still in the district. Um, again, many thanks to the number of uh, staff members who've reached out to the family. Uh, there's a GoFundMe page that's uh, gone around, um, as well as some counseling support that's been offered. Um, but I, I, I'm going to continue on that and then ask for a moment of silence, um, because uh, something Mr. Harrington mentioned a couple weeks ago, but um, you know, uh, kind of conduits through me have given me permission to speak in more detail about the passing of Susan Kennedy Marks. Um, so, Susan's someone I knew really well. Um, she was a former educator in the district. She worked in, in multiple of the elementary schools. Um, she worked at central office in a position around diversity and equity, as well as a principal, assistant principal, and counselor. Um, and she passed away recently after a battle with cancer, and her, her family is now ready to share the news with the broader community, in particular the, the ARPS community. There was an email that went out to all staff yesterday. Uh, many of us, and I consider myself one of them, had the honor to work with Susan and, and got to see the, her extraordinary contributions she made uh, at Fort River at Marks Meadow, which she was an elementary school that used to be in the Amherst Public School District, um, and at Crocker Farm, and um, particularly her deep commitment to social justice and equity. Um, she's been involved in the Roger Wallace 
uh, Foundation as well as other uh, AEF, many, many other things. And retirement for her was not something that, that, that meant stop working or stop being connected to children and particularly this these districts. Uh, as many of the best educators do, Susan enriched the lives of countless students as well as the lives of her colleagues. Um, there is a, um, their family has set up uh, the Sue Kennedy Marks Fund for Social Justice. Um, and there's a website, which is www, uh, it's social justice for all, all one word, dot org. Uh, and this organization will continue to Susan's anti-racism work, which was her passion in life. Um, so given the, the passing of a former student, as well as Ms. Kennedy Marks, uh, I'd ask us all to take uh, a moment of silence in remembrance and honor of, of those two individuals. Thank you. Um, one of Susan's uh, passions and something she worked on was uh, anti-racist curriculum. And I think um, this is uh, unrelated in terms of timing to her passing and the announcement, but I think related to her life's work and life's passions that uh, tomorrow, Ms. Cunningham will start with a group of educators um, because uh, what we're going to commit to is that all of our elementary schools, K to six, uh, all students will receive uh, anti-racist curriculum, direct or anti uh, explicit anti-racist curriculum next year. There's wonderful things that have been done by individual teachers, uh, and it's not to minimize, we're not starting at zero, uh, particularly some of the work that, that you all experienced in terms of school improvement plan about Crocker Farm and their work uh, with teaching tolerance in that organization. Uh, we'll be working and taking off from the work they started, but uh, in Amherst and Pelham, the firm commitment in the fall is that there will be an anti-racist curriculum uh, for all students in grades K to six. And I wanna thank Ms. Cunningham, Ms. Smith, a number of who's the assistant principal at Crocker Farm, Mr. Shea, the principal. We had a really good meeting, kickoff meeting today, just about organization. And uh, I wanna thank Ms. Cunningham for facilitating and, and leading that work. But uh, the firm commitment is that it'll be done for fall. Um, and we'll be happy to share that with the committee before fall, but I wanted to let you know our direct intention is that it's not an optional thing. It's not based on, uh, teacher's background experience, it's for all kids and all staff next year uh, who receive that. Um, so the timeliness of, of mentioning that and uh, while mentioning Ms. Kennedy Marks, again, for those of you who knew her, um, this is, is something that would have been, was incredibly meaningful for her. And I think it's, it's time for us to just commit to it that it's not uh, one school or one particular grade level, it's everybody, everybody has to be in on this. Uh, two other announcements, one a little longer than the other. Um, next Friday is Juneteenth, and um, it's a pretty significant day of um, emancipation, and it's not something that has been celebrated in the same way in terms of officially by the district, but one thing we are implementing this year is for staff members, and this relates to full year staff members only because the school year staff, the school year ends next Thursday, uh, who uh, choose to take this as, as a day of, um, of honoring that day. Uh, it'll be considered almost as if a religious day. So people are able to take it off without having to take a personal day, which has been the past practice of the district. We want to support that. I think a longer conversation in the near future uh, is about whether we can take that off as a, as a as a full holiday for all staff members who are working that day. Uh, that involves some, I tried to work that out logistically as Mr. Dr. Slaughter knows and, and some other folks uh, ran into some, some roadblocks, but I think the commitment that we have is for full year staff who uh, would choose to take that day uh, in honor and remembrance, um, they'll be able to do that without having to take uh, any personal time or, or anything like that. We want to make sure and we want to work towards uh, a larger celebration and perhaps uh, full recognition of the holiday uh, moving forward. Uh, but we wanted to assure all staff who, again, want to take that day off can take it without having to, to pull into their personal or vacation days. Last thing, I just want to update you, uh, and I know we're going to talk about the survey results, but this this is related, but different enough where I feel like it's more in superintendent update than it should be uh, related to the agenda, is I've met with every administrative team except Pelham, which I'm meeting with tomorrow with Lisa and Lee, uh, to go over space. Um, so one of the things that you'll read, and we'll get to this when we do the survey, is some of the feedback is about what, what options, people are searching for what options are feasible. Right. We talked about two general options, and I guess the word choice I would use, I should have used, is what models are feasible. So we've made a lot of inroads. We've looked at different classrooms in different schools, what, what classrooms could be used, what classrooms actually are in use now we wouldn't use because of size or the lack of 
uh, open air, you know, if it's a small classroom with no windows, we would opt not to use that space for a whole host of reasons, both physical and mental health. Um, so we've made a lot of inroads since the last time we talked about this. Again, Pelham will be tomorrow. And I think perhaps not next week, but when we meet again, which is probably as a large group, perhaps the week after that, uh, I think we'll be able to get more nuts and bolts on what, what options are real and what are the implications, both in terms of in-person learning, but also how that intersects with distance learning, because there's a relationship between uh, what teachers are doing and their capacity to do uh, good quality work in person as well as in distance. Uh, to that point, um, we've made some decisions about Wildwood and Fort River. Uh, Wildwood has a number of projects going on this summer. Uh, two quads, carpeting will go to tile. Uh, hallways are being painted. The lighting is getting an LED upgrade. The ELL room is getting a new floor. And the mechanical room is getting some work for better reliability in the winter. All of that combined with some existing challenges uh, at Wildwood that don't exist at Fort River. They're, they're closely related, but they're not exactly the same in terms of all the building materials, uh, has, has resulted in a decision that our staff, our maintenance staff, will be able to make the changes at Wildwood this summer. Um, it won't be as extensive as the changes at Fort River, given some of the challenges of, of the materials in use there, as well as all the other work going on in the Wildwood building. Um, it would, that project to do it at Wildwood would take much longer than just all summer. Um, so we will get it done. Our staff can do that. The Fort River project will be a little more extensive. The walls will be a little more extensive. They'll go above the ceilings, as Mr. Roy Clark uh, talked about yesterday. They're not the same challenges with that at Fort River than there are at Wildwood. And that actually is going, I think, either went out to bid today or will go out to bid tomorrow. Um, I think today. I think um, seeing a nod from someone who might know. So. Um, so uh, we are actively uh, not waiting for the model because that's going to have to happen one way or the other, um, those edits, th those revisions to the spaces. I, I also want to say that um, uh, I think those will improve the quality. I think we do also have to think about when uh, a vaccine is here, we are going to have to uh, re reinstall the temporary wall. So the problems of Fort River and Wildwood, I want to be really clear, are not going away. This doesn't solve. The problems. I got a couple of emails that made me think that uh, some people think, oh yeah, they could have done this a long time ago. We could have if we were going to reduce the class the number of classes uh, significantly. And you know, the, the temporary walls aren't the only problems in those buildings. So I want to be really clear. Maybe I wasn't clear enough last time that the problems of Fort River and Wildwood are not going anywhere. This is actually just a way to, uh, given the virus, to do from a public health perspective to make the buildings uh, habitable and safe uh, around that. That one particular measure, this in no way convinces me that those buildings should have been replaced many, many years ago. Uh, all the needs still exist. Uh, it's just taking one step and one improvement, but it's nowhere close to what those buildings need to be. Uh, so I apologize if I wasn't clear enough. Apparently I wasn't because I got some emails that indicated perhaps that uh, that I was solving the problem. Or this would solve the problem of Fort River and Wildwood. And I would uh, argue that it is a temporary fix um, in a particular situation that does not actually solve the problems of those two schools. And I think that's my update tonight. Any, any comments or questions from any of the committees? Not seeing any. Uh, Ms. Seeger. Hi, I'm not sure if this is the time to ask or maybe later, but in terms of spaces and schooling for the fall, um, is it appropriate to maybe look at spaces outside of the schools that are still located within town? And are you doing that? So we have, I have engaged the town manager of Amherst on that. Um, uh, tomorrow when I talk to Pelham, I think there, there's there's not a little bit, but there there's not a ton, but there are there is a space across the street, for instance, from Pelham School, as well as Pelham Library that's you know worth exploring. In the town of Amherst, the challenge is that any building we'd, we'd have to be in would require a nurse to be present. And so right. one of the things that's a challenge is there's great uncertainty in the state budget. Um, I think it, for anyone who uh, tuned in for the Amherst um, town council meeting on Monday, uh, town council slash finance committee, I think it was, um, I was pretty explicit that I have a lot of concerns about where the state budget is and what it will land to be. Um, but the problem is, you know, in the spaces that I've talked to the town about, we could maybe add a couple classrooms. And from an economy of scale perspective, adding an administrator, a nurse, and a couple classrooms uh, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't push the needle enough 
uh, and it, it pushes our cost needle the other way. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we experience. We also think about accessibility. Uh, there are some buildings that potentially could be okay and they're incredibly inaccessible for students. And in this climate where public health and safety is at the forefront, um, you know, I, I don't see tremendous amount as viable. Certainly if anyone from the community is watching this or any committee member and, and wants to suggest something, but you know, the best we saw was maybe a a space that would involve adding four classrooms in a site and having a full-time nurse, at least some administrative presence in four classrooms uh, is a hard financial hit to take without really moving the needle on, on spaces. So we absolutely have, and again, the more suggestions, the better, right? We got 160 some odd pages of suggestions in the survey uh, so that we wanna keep that coming and keep that two-way flow of information going. Uh, but the challenge of doing it in a public health environment that we're in, uh, create some unique challenges um, for us. Um, but again, the more suggestions, the better. I apologize. I thought it was six o'clock. Welcome, Ron. I um, I uh, had the same same thought. Ms. John Louis. I just want to say thank you to all those um, you know working on putting the anti-racist curriculum into um, into place. That makes me feel really good that we're moving in that direction and um, I can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you, me too. <laughs> Great, any, any other comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, We'll move on. Uh, the next item is the chair's update. Um, I actually don't have an update to provide. I, f I feel like we've been seeing each other a lot. So <laughs> um, we continue our conversations. Are there any announcements from any of the committee members? Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just wanted to give another plug. I know we've done this once or twice before, but um, about uh, what a priority it is for everyone in the community to be filling out the census this year. Um, and, and what a role, uh, hopefully collaborative role, that um, town governments and school committees can be playing in order to broadcast that as, as much as possible. I was, just, I was reminded about this recently. I have the good fortune of living in a neighborhood with multiple members from the League of Women Voters who have been doing a tremendous amount of work to raise awareness about um, the need to fill out the census. And you know, we all know what an impact that has on our federal funding over the course of a decade. Um, and so you know, I know that we obviously have more overflowing on our plate than we normally uh, are able to handle. But, um, you know, I, I just think whatever way that we can uh, add that message in, whether it's it's having information available at meal distribution, or but just always thinking about whenever we're engaging the community, you be talking about the census, it just has such a enormous impact on what we're able to do for the next decade. So fill out your census. <laughs> Ms. Lord. I would like to announce to everyone listening that there will be a school equity task force meeting on June 17th from six to eight. The link and the agenda will be published in, but I just wanted to bring it up right now. Any other announcements from the committees? Not seeing any. Great, so we'll move on to um, our new and continuing business. Um, and our first item is a statement of support for Black Lives Matter. And I'll, um, this uh, was suggested um, by two members of the regional, regional committee, um, Heather Lord and Carrie Spitzer. And so they've drafted a document. I'll turn it over to you both. Okay. Um, before I read it, I want to clarify any confusion around this statement that is talking about racism and, and specifically anti-Black racism. Hopefully most, most of us know that when we say Black lives matter, it does not imply that other lives don't matter. Of course, of course every life matters. Um, but lifting up Black lives is the very thing that will create the shift so that all lives can matter. We will all benefit when we challenge the institutions that have been set up in a classist, heteropatriarchal, ableist, cisgendered, Christian, colonial, white supremacist way. Decentering those powers that cause oppression and privilege 
one over the other can create community communities that are authentically like from the roots up inclusive, equitable, and just. And I also want to thank the educators of Black Lives Matter rally that was held on Saturday, Sunday for your commitment and I want to support you in your work. Carrie, would you like me to read the statement or you want to read the statement? Would you like me to bring it up so people can see it as well? Uh, yes, please. It's a draft. So Ms. Lord, I'd, be, I'd be happy to have you read it if, you, if you'd like. Um, I'm happy to read it as well. So it's, a, yeah. I'm, okay, I'll read it. Okay, either way. <laughs> Sorry, we should have coordinated more on this beforehand. <laughs> it's been a busy day. Yeah, definitely. We mourn along the side, the black community with each life that has been unjustly taken by police violence and white supremacy. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Aubrey, and the list, if it were only one name, it would be too many, but horrifically, this list is in the thousands from when it began. Amid our efforts to cope with a global pandemic, which is also disproportionately taking the lives of black people, we stand, we take a stand against the systemic profiling, harassment, assault, and killing of black people. Deeply rooted racial disparities are exposed here in public health and police surveillance. We also acknowledge, call out, and commit to change the racial disparities that are in our education system. We know that solidarity is not enough and are committed to being accountable and actionable because Black Lives Matter and must no longer be devalued and dehumanized. Amherst Regional School Committee is committed to acknowledging and address addressing the impacts of systemic racism on and within our educational system. We reaffirm that racial justice and equity are important and should be prioritized. Our school improvement plan indicates the social justice commitments we have made. We must do more and our work will continue. As a reminder, they were objective A, increase and maintain staff diversity to re reflect student diversity. Increase the number of teaching staff that are people of color. Objective B, strengthen instructional practices to foster student engagement and teachers and to the school. Objective C, strengthen instructional practices to respond to the cultural identities of students of color while dismantling white supremacy in the system for all students. Objective D, prioritize the well, emotional well-being of students while maintaining high expectations for success. Objective E, widen learning opportunities, STEM, restorative justice, et cetera, to reflect the range of students' interests, diverse post-secondary paths, and socio-emotional needs. Objective F, upgrade educational recreational facilities to meet the needs of every learner and program. The need is for us as individuals and as a community to join the, those who are already participating in this change and ensure that decisions we make are in the best interest of our students and made through the lens of equity. We also take the pledge that was made on Sunday, June 7th, 2020 at the Educators for Black Lives Matter rally created by our educators. As edu the, the pledge goes, as educators and allies, we will work to address inequities that result from institutionally racist policies and practices in our schools and in the communities in which our students live. We choose not to accept these conditions as they exist, but accept the responsibility for changing them. We pledge to take actions that will address access and opportunity for all students by highlighting inequities and increasing awareness organizing for change and growing the movement. In presence and power, Amherst Regional School Committee. Thank you. Are there uh, comments or questions from uh, those in the committee? Uh, Mr. Menino. I just read the letter uh, prior to the meeting. I endorse it, well said. That's all. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that sentiment. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you to Ms. Lord and Ms. Spitzer for putting this together. Um, I think it's, it's this is really, really well written. Um, I, I, I like that the core of it focuses on our practical objectives. It, it brings it brings us back to what we have already committed to in, in, in the context of where we are today. Um, 
I also really like that it doesn't shy away from using um, uncomfortable terms and or terms that might be uncomfortable in conversation. Um, it's like, uh, you know, like white, white, like I, I feel like, you know, um, I've done a lot of reflecting, obviously we've all done a lot of reflecting over the last few weeks. Oh, um, you know, I, I think one thing as, as someone who's white, um, I feel like a, a responsibility is to, is to have no fear or hesitation about having uncomfortable conversations and saying uncomfortable words. So, and part of that is, is learning exactly what these terms are and what they mean um, in, in our institutions today. So like white supremacy, for example, I think is maybe typically thought of as, you know, the KKK and Confederate flags and those sort of ugly, um, horrendous images. Um, but, you know, white supremacy can also be the, the reflection of white privilege in an institution. Um, and, and then the need to dis dismantle that, right? And so, um, you know, these are some of these terms of things I'm still learning about. And I, 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 just, I just value the fact that we have this written here and that we are continuing to have conversations where we're articulating these terms uh, openly and, and, and discussing them without, um, you know, without hesitation. So, so thank you very much for putting this together. Um, I, I can't see everybody on, on the screen. So, um, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and now, uh, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Ms. Spitzer and Ms. Lord again for, for drafting this. And uh, yeah, I was, I was gonna say like, I'm actually proud to be a part of this body with that statement. Like that's, that statement actually is somewhat comforting to me. and, and uh, I also want to wanted to kind of acknowledge that you know our educators who were a part of that that statement that that's a profound statement. I like I really feel that, and and I just wanted to point out that they actually inspired a group of youth that are going to be conducting a youth led march tomorrow. So thank you, thank you. Dr. Morris. So I agree with uh, all the the statements that have made so far, and thank you. And I fully, in my role, endorse the statement as written. Uh, my actually, I just wanted to raise a procedural question, which is um, this is a joint meeting, and so I wonder if uh, there's nothing that precludes this to be either a region only vote or for each committee to take a vote. You know, with some minor edits to names at the end. That's not mine to. That's my not my decision to make. I just wanted to note that it's a joint meeting, uh, and that's you know the committees plural may want to think about whether um, it's endorsed by all three or the region kind of endorses it. You know, kind of by by de facto, which we do in other things in terms of policy. But I just wanted to note that fact and at least give the opportunity for the committees to weigh in on what the best mm -hmm. approach was, since there seems to be broad support for that. Uh, Mr. Menino. I think we best if each committee endorses the document. Ms. Jean Louis. I agree. Ms. Hall. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would love to, obviously, giving all credit and thanks to Ms. Lord and Ms. Spitzer for the work going into drafting it. But I mean, I would take every word of that, absolutely. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Um, and I'll, I'll speak for the other committee, the Amherst School Committee. Um, I, I believe that the five members of that committee would also nod heads and endorse signing it separately. Yes, um, great. Um, so I would, I would also add my um, gratitude and thanks um, to both of you for um, both stepping forward and making this an urgent action um, item and making sure that we address this um, this week. Um, I know you put a lot of long hours into it this week and um, emotional hours. Um, so I really appreciate the time, effort, and strength that you um, pulled together in pulling this together. Um, it's, a, it's a great document and a great statement for us to be able to make. So thank you. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll um, I guess, move uh, to for the region uh, committee to um, endorse this statement as presented. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Stancer. Any further discussion? 
Seeing none, uh, roll call vote uh, on the motion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Thank you. And McDonald, aye. Um, that passes, uh, so the motion passes eight to zero. Would somebody like to make a motion for the Amherst Committee? I move to approve the, uh, the statement, the Black Lives Matter statement. Second. Moved by Harrington, seconded by Demling. Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. And McDonald, aye. So it passes five to zero. And welcome, Mr. Sullivan. Um, I believe you may have uh, had the same, same uh, uh, error in scheduling as I did and uh, Mr. Menino, and um, we actually started at 6 p.m. So I apologize for that um, misunderstanding. I'll turn it over to Ms. Hall. All right, thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion that the Pelham School Committee endorses the Black Lives Matter Statement of Support. I move that the uh, Pelham School Committee uh, adopt the draft letter as uh, presented. All right, is there a second? Uh, Stancer, second. Good. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all right. So Hall, I. Ron. Oh. Jesse. Jean Louis, I. Sarah Best had her hand raised. Sorry. Oh, I didn't notice. I'm sorry, Sarah. Sarah Best, did you have a question? It, do we need to amend the names? Yeah, I mean, well. We're just taking the statement. Yeah, just the statement. And adding the, our names on the bottom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tagging so along. So as Perfect. presented, except for the names. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Okay, Morris. Sorry, Dr. Morris. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can make that uh, with Miss Lord and Miss Spitzer's uh, approval. I can make those minor edits when we will publish this on, you know, on the website and other things. Uh, and we might actually just, just because of space, say the Amherst Pelham and Amherst and Amherst Pelham Regional School District School Committees all voted in you, you know, something like along okay. those to make it a little flow a little better than adding the multitude of names. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Sarah Best, you're up. Uh, Kenny, I. And uh, and I that was everybody, right? Oh no, Margaret. Okay, go ahead, Margaret. Answer I. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, back to you, Allison. Okay, thank you. Um, great, so we'll move on to our next uh, order of business, which is a the personal protective equipment presentation from uh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, and I'll do a quick introduction and pass it over to Jill Consolino, who's our nurse manager, our nurse leader, uh, who will go through this. Um, so the short story of the introduction, uh, and there's some slides that she'll show that were in the packet, uh, as well as the letter from Desi, is that uh, as we're thinking of heading back next year to school, um, we know that based on CDC guidelines uh, and public health guidelines, we need to buy a significant amount of personal protective equipment. Uh, Desi wisely, in my opinion, uh, said, uh, even though our guidance isn't out for this, uh, the full guidance, um, every other state's gonna be ordering lots of PPE for their schools. So why don't we provide uh, a general, some general thoughts uh, some specific thoughts, actually, I shouldn't say general, about what's needed. And we encourage districts to buy three months supply. Um, and um, interestingly, last night, we got an email from them that they're creating some online system to perhaps have some purchasing, not at necessarily a better price, but for districts that didn't have the capacity. Fortunately for us, Ms. Consolino has been working over the last week to itemize ours, uh, our order. And she, uh, I signed the PO this afternoon. So that's good news. Um, and it also means we're getting it out, frankly, a week and a half before the statewide, you know, the DESI 
sort of order and uh, as she can and she can speak to uh that means it'll come sooner as well and and things aren't back ordered and things that are back ordered you know where we feel very comfortable with coming before fall uh it's a significant amount of materials and, and items and so in the slides Ms. Consolino will just do a broad overview of the types of uh, public health measures that are being recommended to us uh, and how we're approaching them. Uh, and then if there's questions, she can answer more specifics on the on the PPE and and what's been what was ordered today uh, and how we're thinking about this moving forward. Am I missing anything for an introduction, Ms. Consolino? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up your slides and when you want the next slide, uh, just tell me next slide and then I'll move it along. Sure, thank you. Tell me if this is visible. Um, is that good? We're actually seeing ourselves. <laughs> oh, still? Huh. Let me stop doing that and try again. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry about that. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. So good evening, everybody. As Dr. Morris said, my name is Jill Consolino. I um, took on the position of school nurse manager for the district um, back in the middle of December, and then the pandemic hit um, mid-March. And so, um, as he explained, um, Department of Ed um, has given us some guidance as um, priorities to take for returning to school safely in the fall. Um, and the, there's five key areas that we're looking at for returning for face-to-face -face learning. Um, and those are in the areas of personal protective equipment or PPE, uh, facial coverings and masks, hand washing and sanitization, isolation and discharging, discharge planning, and then student and staff screening. Next slide. So on the PPE front, um, what the CDC is saying is that the best way to avoid getting the illness is actually to um, have some type of personal protective equipment to protect ourselves and prevent the illness from being um, spread and from people to be exposed to the to the illness itself. Um, and so we're looking at various different types of, of PPE, um, some that will be required for um, for general staff to be worn, um, and then for staff that are more involved with um, higher intense, higher need students, and then also our custodial staff and nursing um, will get special equipment that'll be provided to them. Um, next slide. And then on the, the facial coverings and masks, this is the hot topic for everybody. Um, what the, the key to this whole um, thinking is that, the virus itself is um, spraying, spread from person to person um, through respiratory droplets when somebody who's infected with the virus coughs, talks, or sneezes. And so the reason why we want everybody in what's being pushed is from CDC and Department of Public Health is for everybody to wear a mask or facial covering is so that you're protecting yourself from other people and other people are protecting themselves from you. Um, and so, and the studies have shown that people who are asymptomatic or don't have symptoms can spread the virus um, before they show um, any types of symptoms. So um, going into the fall, we will be requiring all students and staff who are able to, to wear a facial covering or a mask. Um, and then the, the guidance for people who should and should not wear masks is on this slide, um, mainly people that are under two, a health condition or someone who cannot um, take a mask, put a mask on or off by themselves. Next slide. Um, and then the biggie to preventing this virus is hand washing and sanitization. Um, so we're um, focusing on hand washing um, in the areas that we can with, um, you know, classrooms that have sinks and the classrooms that don't, we're looking at um, hand sanitizer to be put in those classrooms and then um, touchless hand sanitizer dispensers in main areas in all of the buildings. We're also going to look at putting those on our vehicles as well, like the buses and vans will have um, pump dispensers that the drivers can um, give the students to clean their hands. So students will clean their hands coming on transportation, leaving transportation, and then when they enter the school buildings. Um, and then we're gonna have new protocols in place for um, cleaning the buildings using specific um, reg EPA registered disinfectants. Um, and then if we do have an area that's um, affected by this virus with a student, the criteria and the ideal is to have this area blocked off for 24 hours before disinfecting, but that that may or may not happen, so we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. Next slide. 
Um, student and staff screening, um, we're going to adopt a policy if you are not well to stay home. Um, and we're going to, we have a protocol um, in place for the district for reasons why students would be sent home. That's going to be tweaked a little bit over the summer. Um, and we're going to ask for staff and for families to self-report um, if they have any symptoms, if they've been um, if somebody has tested positive for the virus or they've been exposed in the last 14 days to someone who's um, tested positive for the virus. Um, the hot topic was if temperature screenings would be um, mandatory for a lot of buildings, but right now um, DPH is not recommending that because there's a lot of false positives and false negatives with temperature screenings. So we're going to probably go based on a symptom. Um, symptom checker for um, all of our students and staffs. Um, and it's Honestly, it's going to take way too long if we try to temperature screen everybody walking into the building on a daily basis and a lot more, a lot more nursing power that I don't have control over. Um, next slide. And then finally is isolation discharge planning. Um, so anybody who exhibits, exhibits symptoms that's in our building, um, they will be asked to go home. Um, a student, we are looking at a separate isolation room for students to go into. Um, outside of the nurse's office. Um, this will be separate from where healthy students are evaluated. Somebody will be designated to stay with the student until a parent is um, deemed to, parent has to come pick them up. Um, my goal is for a parent to come pick up within an hour. Um, any staff members who are symptomatic, they're gonna be required to leave um, for the day. And then we will have, um, we're gonna work on new guidance for when somebody can return, is safe to return to work. And then the whatever room, this person has been in, we'll go through those, um, the cleaning procedures as well. Um, so that's the slides that you guys have. Um, and then what I did over the last couple of days, as Dr. Morris said, was I, we had this huge list that DESE um, Department of Education provided us with a formula um, to purchase per PPE for um, our students, our staffs, um, people that are more involved, custodial staff, um, staff with special ed students. Um, and so, the rough estimate dollar wise, it's going to total about $240,000 for the first to get us ready for the first 12 weeks of school in the fall. Um, and that breaks down to um, three uh, 100,000 adult masks, 16,000 pediatric masks, thir about 13,000 KN95 masks, um, reusable face shields and eye eyewear protection, um, a couple hundred of those, um, isolation gowns. Close to 10,000 of those, um, about 20,000 pairs of gloves, um, and then hand sanitizer. We're looking at about 250 of um, pump bottles to go in classrooms that don't have sinks, um, and then gallon refills for each one of those. So we're, we purchased 750 gallons of hand sanitizer, um, and then we looked at I ordered um, some sanitizing wipes for um, all the classrooms, nurses' offices, and then the touchless hand sanitizing dispensers, uh, 50, about 55 of those, refills for those, and then refills for the soap that we have in all the bathrooms and sinks and stuff, um, about 45 cases of those. And then also the state required us to have some type of disposal medium, which we try, I tried to look for a definition of that, but essentially it's some type of receptacle for um, you know the, all the equipment to go into. So a, tra a specific trash barrel for um, every building. So um, I got together with um, with Rupert Roy Clark, who's our facilities director, and we um, we purchased um, according to the needs of each each specific building and came up with 15 for each building. Um, and then I got uh, Dr. Morris a spreadsheet um, of and broke it down by um, each school district for what would be spent. I'd be happy to entertain any questions on any of this huge list <laughs> or any specifics. Yeah, but I mentioned one Dr. thing before we, um, transition uh, to questions, which is uh, the thing about isolation rooms that Ms. Consolino uh, mentioned, that directly connects back to some of the space conversations that I've been having with principals because we want to think about what's a space that um, can be isolated easily, but also one that's not far from the nurse's office, right? We wouldn't want a student or a staff member who had to be in it to be trekking across the building, right? Just both from a, for all sorts of reasons, that wouldn't be good. So we are starting to isolate, um, a bad choice of words, we are starting to identify uh, where the those room slash rooms could be. And we're trying to think of a, a main room and a backup room, not that we're anticipating needing it, but I think we always want to plan for the worst case scenario. 
Um, and if a student gets sick and feels sick and that room is not ready and another student or staff member feels sick, uh, we want to plan for that. So we're having active conversations uh, and that's directly connected to the space conversation mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to connect what I said in, in the superintendent update to um, that one point. But thank you, Ms. Consolino. You're welcome. Thank you. I saw lots of hands up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with Mr. Menino, whose hand is still up. A question and a comment. Uh, with all the universities in the nation and all the school systems ordering this stuff, do you really think you're going to have your purchase order filled on time? We, I submitted four purchase orders today with four different companies, and the majority of the items we're purchasing were in stock today. Um, and we should have the majority of what we're purchasing by the end of the month. Thank you. And a comment for um, Mr. Morris. Uh, when you were switching up her PowerPoint slide, it was the first time in the history of these meetings that my face appeared on the grid. Would you please do that glitch again so I can <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> I see your face. So, uh, I think it's yes, a well, You <laughs> did something in my was right there in the uh, Brady Bunch. Google wants to just make sure that we're not staring at ourselves, our own faces while we're meeting. Um, I, I saw uh, Ms. Seeger, I think, and Ms. Jean Louis. And did you have your? No. Oh, okay, so Ms. Seeger. And then Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling. So one, one thing I'm curious about in terms of ordering masks is um, in reading through the guidelines for purchasing from DESE, they talk about parents providing masks. And one of the questions I personally had is, can uh, will homemade masks suffice for these students? And are you planning on providing masks for everybody um, student-wise, or are you anticipating that, that students will bring their own masks, and if they don't have them, then provide them? So the, our hope is that everybody will be able to provide their own mask and it can be either, you know, a, a cloth mask, like a handmade mask or a surgical type mask. And so the supplies Jesse wants us to have on hand is um, if, if somebody forgets a mask or if they're not able to afford a mask, um, like we, we know that we're going to run into that speed bump. Or if somebody's mask, you know, gets ruined during the school, the, the course of a school day and we need to replace it. So that's where the, the basis of their decision making came from. And actually, Dr. Morris and I, we tweaked the formula a little bit um, and bumped up the number for um, the, the younger kids um, and did a little bit more for the for the students versus staff, um, just with the anticipation that we may need to provide for more students than staff. Okay. Ms. Spitzer. Thank you very much. Um, I had one, or maybe two questions. So the first one has to do with the issue of um, hand sanitizer versus soap. So everything I've read has said that like soap is actually preferable to using hand sanitizer. Um, I'm just concerned if there are kids who throughout the day are only gonna have access to hand sanitizer rather than actually being able to use soap and water to, because everything I've read has said it's better to use soap and water and then have the hand sanitizer for the moments when you can't use. Um, and if it's going to be that kids are in specific rooms for the entire school year without being able to move around much, then it seems like there'll be a group of students who are going to be missing out on the opportunity to wash their hands in the preferred way. Um, so how big of, I mean, it sounds like you're still figuring this out, but I, I, I just want to flag this as something that I, I, I as a parent, I'd want to have my kid in a room with a sink and uh, some soap. Um, and then the other thing was um, thinking about issues around privacy and um, I like contract tra contact traits from everything I've read, like, you know, make testing, contact tracing, those things kind of come up as what needs to be in the environment around the school and potentially through the school to have um, better control of the virus. So how do we balance um, privacy concerns and making sure we're not disclosing, you know, confidential information about the kids and also making sure that if, if we do unfortunately have a case of COVID in the schools that we notify everybody who needs to know. And um, maybe that's a conversation for a an, an, an future date, but it's on my mind. Well, I'll start a little bit with the first one, Jill, if that's okay. Yep, go ahead. I think thinking about the elementary schools, the majority of those spaces have sinks in their classrooms. 
that's not true at some of the upper grade, the regional district. Um, so it's not necessarily practical given the number of classrooms and the number of bathrooms for students to always leave the room to go to the bathroom to wash their hands. Um, so I think some of it's just a practical concern of the number of kids, the number of sinks, which at the elementary level, uh, I just frankly know this, even if you go back to uh, when we were testing our water, if you remember, there's, there's an unbelievable number of sinks uh, at the elementary level compared to the regional level. And so I think some of it's just the practicality of where the bathrooms are located and how long it would take for students to, to get there, um, depending on the structure of the building. Um, but I'll, everything else I'll leave to Ms. Consolino, but uh, I just, that one I knew, so I figured I'd give you a breath. Yeah, so we're, we, you know, it'll be a work in progress with the sinks versus hand sanitizer and what classrooms, uh, you know, kids will get placed in. Um, but to answer the confidentiality question and the contact tracing, um, we, I have expressed it to the state level as well as a bunch of nurse leaders in this area that I'm um, part of a, a group um, that we, we meet on a weekly basis. And it's a, it's a big concern about how the information will get, um, delivered to the school system um, from the public health standpoint. Um, right now, public health is able to give the information to um, EMS providers for addresses. Um, if a call goes to a specific address with a COVID positive person, that guidance hasn't been made for the school districts yet. So our concern is if we have somebody um, in the school district in one of the towns that tests positive for the virus, how is that information gonna get to the school district? Um, and we don't know that we don't know that answer yet. Um, and I'm hoping that guidance comes sooner than later. Um, but if we do end up with somebody who we're suspecting of um, being, you know, of being symptomatic um, in the school district, then we will, um, you know, all that information stays private. It stays, you know, it will get documented in our um, electronic charting system. And the the people that need to know will, you know, we will contact parents to pick up that individual. Um, and then if we need to contact trace it back to say a classroom, nobody, no names will be identified. Um, you know, we will say that um, there's been, you know, a suspected case in this classroom and you've been identified, the way it's handled is you'll say you've been identified as a close contact. Um, and this, these are the recommendations that we're following from DPH. So no identifiers will be, um, you know, presented to anybody. So confidentiality will be maintained. And just one other piece of that is that we do have an HR, um, oh, we, excuse me, we have a staff support working group, as you know, uh, thinking about fall. And they're actively having conversations about this as well as, as at what point does staffs need to know versus students and families need to know, because I think there is some distinction there perhaps um, around that as a staff member, they have a little more access to student information if a student, for instance, is, is uh, become sick. Um, so uh, those are those are thorny issues that we're working out on, mul there's multiple angles to that uh, about what does the larger group know and what does the smaller group know and who's on a need to know basis even within the school um, around those types of things. So uh, we are relying on DPH um, and, and I will say again, you'll hear me say it even more because she won't, she's retiring not that long and I'm very sad about that, but Julie Fetterman has been an absolute rock star health director in town of Amherst. Uh, even when we had some, some issues at the after school closed, uh, she was able to really help guide us uh, around the requirements. And I think frankly, the requirements continue to change and evolve. Um, so, you know, they evolve within a week, you know, some point in late March from no one needs to know to we need to tell people to we don't need to tell people. I think at this point, the, the better part of where we were as compared to then is the health departments in general have had more time to process the best methods. You know, everything was happening so live in March that it was hard to process it. And, and I feel like the, we're getting more consistent uh, feedback and protocols these days, uh, which is understandable given the, the pace that was happening in the spring versus where we are now. Um, I, I'm seeing two more hands, but um, Mr. Demling, you had, you had been on deck already. Do you did you have a question, or do you want to wait? Yeah, if that's all right. Yep. And then uh, Ms. Stancer and Ms. John Louis. Um, thank you for very informative, uh, time efficient presentation. You could give a class in teaching on uh, a uh, giving a presentation at the school committee. That was really good. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, I would I would really love it if you're able to come back and present to us again as we're closer to the fall and we have a better idea what the model is. I think a big part of what our role is on school committee is um, showing the community um, that we have we know what the plan is and that we're prepared to execute it, um, and uh, and also setting student expectations 
And uh, you have a really great grasp of that and you communicate really well. So thank you for that. Um, my question's about um, younger kids and, tra and the transportation and the protocol there. And this might be more of a Dr. Morris question. Um, you know, feel free to whoever answer. But when I think about kids getting on a bus and needing to sanitize their hands and needing to keep a mask on and then needing to sanitize hands when you're getting off the bus, uh, for our youngest kids, that's a lot of uh, potential oversight that's required if, if we're going to be consistent and have that protocol be reliable. And, you know, we don't have that staffing on our buses right now. And so what, what's, what's the vision there uh, in terms of how that protocol is implemented? Yeah, it's not going to be the super satisfying answer. So that's one, the one area I would argue CDC guidance was not particularly clear. One of the things that you'll notice if you go over that CDC guidance is step two of that guidance has pretty prescriptive number of students on a bus step three in their guidance um has nothing like you know it's like you could go from 12 kids on a bus to 57 apparently you know uh and, and obviously that's not not true so uh we have received direct feedback from desi that they will give very prescriptive guidance about transportation and on that particular front we're looking forward to having prescriptive guidance uh but i think you're right to note some people are feeling like do we need monitors on every bus how many kids are going to be on a bus if there's 12 kids on a bus maybe we don't if there's 30 kids on a bus, maybe we do. Um, so we'll look forward to that. I know that the state is working with the Mass Department of Public Health on those particular issues. Um, so um, I know we continue to wait for DESE guidance on, on many things, but that's a pretty critical one. Uh, I wanna be really clear, it's likely that, I don't see a scenario by which we're not, uh, which is the opposite of how I usually feel. We're not encouraging some families to be able, who can to be able to transport their kids to do that. Uh, there's no way we're going to be able to run enough buses without some parental support. Not everyone has the capacity, you know, the ability to have a car. That's a privilege. But for those who do, uh, we're going to really rely on that because the buses are going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I frankly think that the optimistic side of me says that I know I've heard much feedback from many families who are unconcerned about bus transportation because they're going to feel much more safe driving their kids to school, no matter what safeguards we put in place. It's just something that people are feeling more comfortable about uh, as opposed to a school bus. Um, and it's not about what we would or wouldn't have in place. It's just, I think uh, there's a lot of anxiety, right? And, and I think anyone who's a parent who has school age kids feels that anxiety, no matter what safeguards are in place. So I think we will have to talk about what safeguards the bus needs and then to realistically try to plan out how many kids, how many students are taking a bus at any given time and whether those bus runs need to be staggered. Uh, even between schools at the same grade level band. Um, so a lot to come on transportation. That's one of the kind of, I said at the beginning, we're feeling better about what options are in terms of space, uh, but the transportation is going to, I don't know a different word. I don't mean to be make a pun, but drive a lot of uh, some of the, some of the decisions that are made about uh, capacity. Uh, and some of that's going to be where we are going to have to survey families about uh, their interest in, in transporting their own children uh, and how much they will need to rely on the bus and, um, it's going to be that it's one of the largest variables in the whole operation. But right now, we're still sort of waiting on that guidance. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stancer, um, I'm wondering about the use of masks. Um, you know, the guidelines that I've seen, I've been involved in making masks um, about not touching them, about washing them. If they're cloth masks, they should be washed. Um, how many days can surgical masks be worn and still be effective? Um, is there going to be that kind of information available for people? Um, there will be. We are the, I'm actually on one of the, heading one of the planning committees that we have for the district for, um, you know, the reopening and it's the facilities and operations planning committee and we will be putting together guidance and um, education for students, families, and staff um, for a whole host of things um, in preparation for the fall. Um, I had I did a little bit of research um, last week on um, the KN95 masks, which are the, the higher level medical grade masks. And um, when you, you can put those in a paper bag after use um, and that'll self sanitize itself. And you can actually get five uses out of um, one of those masks um, for, if you can rotate them. Um, to prolong the usage of those um, surgical masks, because you have to look at how long you can, um, you know, you can go with individual, um, you know, sanitizing those in between, you know, putting them in a bag in between each one. Because um, I know there's uh, methods that you can do that. 
Um, and then like, you know, with a, a cloth handmade mask, the preferred method is, you know, once it's been worn for a certain number of hours to, to remove it and then to wash it in, in you know, hot water and let it air dry um, to, to get rid of the, you know, any potential virus that, that stays on it. But we're, we will be working on some type of, you know, education for, for the whole district. I was going to put into chat the order because I'm seeing that. So I see um, uh, Ms. Don Louis has been waiting. Um, and then I see uh, Ms. Kenny and Mr. Menino. And I'll go in that order because Mr. Menino's um, already had a chance to ask. <laughs> um, so my question is um, around where you talked about those who that medically can't wear a mask. Could you suggest like alternatives to wearing a mask if um, like someone has asthma and it constricts breathing or anxiety around it or, um, yeah, so alternatives to masks. So students in particular, if they have, if they meet that criteria, they won't be required to wear a mask or a facial covering. Um, staff that interact with those students will get um, extra protective equipment. Um, what It's probably going to be a full face shield that they'll wear um, to protect themselves. Um, but if students fall into that category of, um, you know, having some either a, a disability or a medical condition that prevents them. And that goes actually now in general public, if you have, you know, a condition that prevents you from wearing one that you're not required to, um, you know, we can, I can suggest, you know, a different type of facial covering, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't require students if it would escalate a situation for them to, to wear one. It's, it would be the recommendation. Um, and we know that, you know, the, our youngest children, like, you know, and, preschool or kindergarten, um, you know, they they may not tolerate wearing a mask for the entire day. So it'll be something that we'll address on a, you know, a case by case basis. Thank you. Just, just another thing um, that I think we'll have to come back to over time is also just the training needed for staff, uh, as well as the training needed for students. Uh, we may want to look again at that school year calendar and see if there's a way to, to get an extra day for staff before the school year starts. Because when you're talking about young children, um, some of that's just around um, how do you, not all kids at that age, at any age level particularly, have worn a mask before and certainly very few have worn it for the, the duration of time um, that they'll be at least encouraged to wear it if not asked to, depending on their age level. And so some of that's really developing programs to support staff about how to work with young children uh, and all the what ifs. Um, because, you know, what we know about working with children in any situation is you have a plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D, and we want to make sure our staff are equipped to be able to support students. Uh, and also to make sure that students who can't wear it for a whole host of reasons, as Ms. Consolino said, um, aren't potentially the targets of um, ire. Uh, from from other students or, or adults uh, or the parents of other students. So we're going to need a lot of both uh, staff training, student training, and actually community training. Uh, and one of the things that I know in talking with Dr. Brady and, and Ms. Smith is uh, looking at community resources that can help assist students to, to build some tolerance of that over time, um, because I think that's going to be critical as well for certain populations of students. Miss okay. um, Kenny. Okay, I have three real quick things. One, have we thought about possibly, um, you know, there's all the don't wear a hat rules, maybe talking about those as a way to protect everybody's ears from aggressive rubbing. Um, and then um, secondly, ha especially for the staff, have we thought maybe about, I mean, we did this for our personal staff, the cost of respirator, respirators with refillable cartridges rather than the uh, disposable masks. They, A, work a little bit better, they last a little bit longer, you know, all those kinds of things. And then I'm, we talked about a lot of money. <laughs> Is, are, are our magic money fairies gonna come and deliver us, you know, gifts? How how is this gonna? <laughs> what is this gonna look like? <laughs> Those are my three quick things. Well, okay. You know, why don't you do the first two, and I'll let Dr. Slaughter talk about the fairies. Sure. Okay. I figured. So, yeah. So we we have not. Um, I haven't. Um, looked into the idea of hats or like headbands that I've seen, um, you know, in healthcare that um, end up getting worn because of the the tour that you know what it 
it ends up doing to you know your ears and stuff. So it, that'll be um, you know a topic that I'll talk with you know Dr. Morris about um, if we need to go down that road because um, it it will probably be something that comes up with a lot of students um, and staff too. Um, and then with the respirators with the disposal filters, those you know I've seen in. Um, hospitals, you know, I've seen healthcare settings that they wear those um, and those were easier to obtain at some point um, for staff. Um, so it's what we what we looked at initially was what was based on DESI guidance um, for the requirements that they gave us last week. So that's what we looked at right now. Um, and we may, you know, if we run into, a you know, a speed bump, we may need to look into a different alternative too. So but the, the staff that need that requires the um, higher level of protection, um, those we've ordered KN95s for, so that's a higher grade. So um, our nursing staff, um, um, some of the special education staff that will work on a one-to-one -one basis. So the, the staff with the higher levels of needs, um, they'll get the, the higher level um, protective masks. And then Mr. Slaughter can answer the, the magic, magic money fairy question. <clears throat> I have my magic wand right here. No, uh, I don't have a magic wand. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it is an open question, one that worries all of us a lot. Uh, me, mostly, or more so maybe than others who were thinking about how to sort of operationalize some things. But but certainly, uh, you know, where the resources come from and is, is a difficult question. There are uh, some funding identified. Um, and the next topic on your on your agenda gets into it a little bit. But but really there's sort of three pots of money. There's FEMA uh, has some uh, funds available. There's some, uh, and then there's two other chunks of money uh, from the CARES Act, uh, one particularly for these kinds of things. And then another one that's more about operational expenses for the school year, but obviously, you know, uh, we'll leverage those resources in, in the best way we can to, to sort of execute what we have to do to, to have school. So um, I'll leave it at that just to sort of Paint the picture a little bit, but I think you know we're ever hopeful that uh, you know, the the powers that be, namely the federal government, who has the most resources to do this, would would you know come through with some additional supports for schools across the nation because it's not just a Massachusetts issue or a Amherst problem. It's it's you know or a Pelham problem or you know it's it's nationwide. So it's a massive problem that they need to really wrap their heads around. I think at the federal level, but I'll stop at that point. <laughs> Dr. Morris. Just to add to Dr. Slaughter's statement, I think um, two things. One is that um, we are working with our municipalities uh, and I've reached out to them because they have CARES Act um, that is directly related to um, staff who interact with the public and our students actually technically are members of the public. Um, so uh, we, we're trying to engage not just the school but, but budget, but to see if the municipalities will support us in that. I think the other thing to note, and I, I, I send a lot of emails to you also. I'm not sure I sent this one or not, but ASBO, which is the National Business Officials Organization, and then uh, my professional organization, which is uh, the Associ National Association of Superintendents, did a study. Uh, and there's too many factors for this to be uh, directly applicable to every district, but the average district in the United States has about 3,600 students. So we have about 2,600 between our three districts. And they estimate the costs you know, between $1.5 and $2 million of all the additional COVID needs uh, that are needed. And, you know, again, you look at our district, some are like, no, we, we have a nurse in all of our buildings. We wouldn't need that cost. Other ones, uh, we were less well positioned uh, financially to be able to handle. But I think any way you cut it, uh, whatever the funding source is, um, these are real costs. And so Ms. Gonzalino read that number. And again, that's the best guess for the first three months of the school year. That's not the year supply. Um, so if you know you multiply that by three, you're getting an estimate of you know about three quarters of a million dollars, and that's not including staffing cost, right? That's just the materials, the P the you know it's beyond PPE because I know it's about sanitizer and other things. But um, so I think it it is a concern. Uh, I think from the Pelham perspective, um, there is twenty thousand dollars of of CARES Act funds. Um, well, you don't receive Title One funds. The the DESE made sure that every district got some funding from that, but we are trying to reach out to the municipalities uh, and had some positive responses about wanting to support the schools in that way, given this expenses and given the funds that uh, the municipalities received. So just wanted to add a little bit to that statement, because I know the next agenda item is, is, is somewhat focused on um, voting on potential resolutions more than some of the details on, on your question. 
Um, before I uh, go to Mr. Menino's question, just to stay on this um, question of the money. So you mentioned two hundred and forty-five thousand dollars for the first three months. How does that? Do you have a sense for how that that divides between the three districts? I do. I actually I broke it down, and just before I, we finished, we got to the dinner table, and um, my brain was my eyes were fried from doing so many calculations. Um, <laughs> So it breaks down, um, and I what I did was I looked at um, the enrollment for um, every every school district um, and what where the um, the the supplies would need to go to based on students and staff and stuff. Um, so some broke down evenly, and some um, like pediatric masks we don't have any pediatric, um, you know, we don't have any and young kids at the high school level and middle school level. So, you know, that went directly in between um, um, Amherst and Pelham. And so the way it broke down um, was for the region, um, it was about $117,000. Um, Amherst was around $97,000 and Pelham was around $26,000. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Menino, uh, before I go to Mr. Menino, are there others that haven't asked, had a chance to ask a question that would like to ask one? Mr. Uh, Mr. Harrington. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to ask this with as much brevity as I can. So as far as the, the N95 masks, right? I, I know that, that OSHA actually like classifies them as, as uh, respirators, which means that you're required to have a fit test. I'm wondering that since we're a municipality and don't necessarily fall under the umbrella of OSHA, we, we adhere to uh, Department of Labor Standards. That's the that's DLS, right? So um, are, A, are we required to have the staff that will be using the N95s, are, are we required to have them fit tested? And B, does DLS, or do you know if DLS defines them the same as OSHA? So because of the fit testing, I stayed away from N95s and went with KN95s. So those don't require fit testing. Um, and it's a, so it's a, it's a lar little bit of a larger mask. Um, and there's two straps that go behind the head. So it's a more, a little bit more of a comfortable fit. Um, and was the reason was because you have to be fit tested for an N95 because it's a specific fit. Um, and those are more geared towards, you know, hospital and medical facility settings. And because we're going to have a, a wide range of staff wearing them just outside of nursing um, and some of the, um, you know, higher intensive needs um, staff. That's why I stayed away from those and went with the KN95s to eliminate that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, Mr. Menino, you're up. Do you do you anticipate encountering a student who refuses to wear a mask based on political conviction? I I can jump in on this one. Um, <laughs> but that's not a that's not a you question. I don't think. I think that's a me question. So this is coming up a lot in my listserv and meetings I'm having with Desi and other superintendent groups. Um, there is. There are some people who um, strongly disagree with the use of masks in schools, um, not from a, you know, the, what Ms. Consolino said before in terms of, uh, you know, either someone with disabilities or um, health needs uh, or just age and developmental level, um, but for political beliefs. And we are looking for explicit guidance from DESE on how to manage that situation. Uh, when we receive that, I will be sure to share that with the committee, even if we don't have a meeting, because I know it is a question that is on a lot of people's minds, mine included. Um, and um, whether this is a, a civil liberties issue, as some people are framing it, or it's a public health issue. Um, and uh, I think there's a difference of opinion on some members across our, comp I'm not even talking about the nation, I'm talking about specific to Massachusetts right now uh, on that particular topic. And I think that's where we're looking forward looking for consistent guidance that's not Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, Shootsbury specific, but actually is across the Commonwealth would be incredibly helpful. So to Thank date, you. we don't have it, but we're looking forward to it and we've been assured it'll come. Um, I, I actually have one more question on the, uh, regarding the face masks for, um, uh, thinking of the students, but also I guess it applies to the adults um, staff as well. Is there, um, what sort of flexibility in terms of definition of a, of a face mask um, are we planning on? So we, a lot of um, 
a lot of kids were wearing um, bandanas as opposed to an actual mask or sort of neck gaiters, um, you know, the, the, you know, that sort of cover the whole neck and, and face. Um, are those acceptable face coverings as well? So they would be because I'm just, I'm looking at the DESI guidance and it says students and staff must wear a face covering or mask. So what's defined as face covering or mask would be acceptable. Um, and, you know, we may put out a list of examples of what would be acceptable, um, but according to what DESI wants, it, it doesn't have to be a, a quote unquote mask. It can be a facial covering, which is what is being given out for guidance with DPH right now too. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Spencer, I saw your hand. A short follow-up question about the budget piece. Um, I think at the beginning, when you were talking about the dollars, you said that you had ordered enough for the first 12 weeks of school. So could we assume that those costs are just gonna cover 12 weeks and we'd actually probably need to reorder and it's gonna, for the entire year, be substantially more? Possibly, and there's, um, there is actually a burn calculation uh, uh, formula that uh, the CDC has put out that we will be probably using to see based on our initial stock of what we have and then how you know how quickly we go or how quickly or how slowly we go through supplies how how we'll need to reorder so you know they the, Desi wanted us to order for the first 12 weeks based on the numbers that we had and then we may have to you know do two additional reorders like that or we may have to reorder half as much for the next 12 weeks and it, it's one of those things that will be like only time will tell. Yeah, and I'll just add that some of that depends on how many students are in mm -hmm. school and also the rate of student and staff um, bringing their own masks and the use of those. Uh, those are huge variables. So I think anytime you're thinking of a statewide expectation or CDC nationwide, there's gonna be a lot of variance uh, district to district. Uh, and some of that's just based on uh, an incredible number of factors. So. Um, I think that's why they're strongly advising us to advise families uh, and staff members that, um, you know, much like sometimes people, you know, get school supplies in the summer that um, this is this is a critical school supply. Uh, and we know that so for some families, that's going to be a hardship and we're going to need to provide that. And we're source, source of course, going to do it. And much like homework, sometimes kids forget to bring it in. Uh, and we want to have a supply for that as well. Um, I have heard from a number of staff members who are, um, Particularly, you know, these are going to be disposable because that's the, the safe way for us to do it, um, not to hand out ones that need to be laundered. Uh, we don't have the capacity to do that. And, and uh, But I know that there's a number of staff members who, in particular, want to kind of encourage um, others. And, and there's people who are literally making their own, which I'm always amazed with. Um, so there's some efforts that all staff members um, have some capacity to have washable masks just from the environmental impact element, let alone from the, the comfort and some of the other um, other pieces as well. Ms. Seeger. So I'm curious, a follow up to the budget and ordering question. Um, when I know that in the DESI guidance, there's recommendations on how to buy quantities and along with the columns of um, assuming 100% attendance, 50% and 25. And I'm just curious, um, I know nothing has been decided in terms of how school is going to be laid out for the fall, but it, what, what was what was the assumption um, in purchasing? If it was, you know, what percentage of maybe students in the building? So the way the no, the way I worked the numbers was um, based on. Did I do? I think so. The with the disposable masks, that was the one where Desi gave. Um, you know, at at one hundred percent attendance, fifty percent attendance, and twenty five percent attendance, and. I think I did, we, we accounted for, um, like for students, you know, one per student per week. Um, and then, and the, the two proposed, um, you know, we, if we have, you know, some of the students come a couple days a week and then some come the rest of the week, at some point we will have every student in the building. Um, so to account for that. Um, and I, I think what I did was I went with, um, 
the you know the worst case scenario with having everybody in the building at one time which we know it's not going to happen but we may you know do a staggered uh, you know attendance but that's to be determined um but to get enough for you know every student to have one um you know if they forget one and then for staff we cut down on the recommendation for um the the teachers and staff number um and then with nurses um and other um health providers i went by the number that they had given with which what was like for disposables 10 per week um and then they also those those staff members will probably get um some of the the kn95s too and then something that had come up um from the special ed um area was for our um, hearing impaired students and, and the staff that teach them um, and our, our ELL students and speech therapists. And so we're looking at um, a clear version of a just, you know, a wash, a clear mask. So the, the whole face is clear. Um, it's made of a clear plastic and I, I have a, a source for those. I'm just waiting for the numbers um, so that those students and staff can can have the, the appropriate accommodation so that they don't, you know, when you have a, a barrier in front of a face and you need you need it for speech, you know you can't listen to that person. You can't you know read lips and stuff. So we're we're looking that at, at that avenue too. Okay. Are there any other questions? Anybody who hasn't asked a question yet that would um, any follow up questions? I'm seeing none. Last call. <laughs> Great. I think we're we're good. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Consolina. That was um, very helpful. Over you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I will. I as Mr. Demling requested, I will probably be back at some point this summer to give an update and stuff closer to closer to school. But yep. Wonderful. Great. And um, speaking of the funding fairies, um, uh, <laughs> next on our agenda is um, a resolution or three resolutions for state funding for COVID-19 related items. And this was brought to the um, committee by Mr. Demling. So I'll turn it over to him to introduce the topic. Sure, um, Dr. Morris, I don't know if we could bring it up. Uh, okay, so while Dr. Morris is bringing that up. So I'll just talk about what the spark and the origin of this was. So we've already alluded to it. So we have all these expenses uh, that we're going to, additional expenses, unplanned for expenses uh, for the fall uh, that we're gonna have, that's, it's, it's going to have to get paid for somehow. And it's not just what Ms. Consolino just talked about, staffing, it's transportation. So how does that all get paid for? And so this, this was, the spark for this was really this past Friday when Desi released its initial um, guidance about purchasing PPE. And, you know, essentially said, so here's, you know, we recommend you go ahead and purchase this. So there you go, go ahead and purchase it. And um, that sparked quite the negative reaction and concern among a number of um, school committee members online uh, about, uh, well, if, if we don't have the funding to pay for these things, then where is it going to come from? And, and you know, at the end of the day, who, who's left holding the bag? Because, you know, right now there is a lot being um, a lot of hope being uh, placed on, on the magic money fairies um, that we talked about, the CARES Act, FEMA, and a massive federal uh, stimulus that, that we hope for. Um, but but if that doesn't happen uh, and, and and we have to deal with what we have, then then who's left holding the bag, right? If 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 that, that doesn't come through, and and right now the the state's implication is that that we're left holding the bag. Um, and that, um, you know, if we have to pay for these things that are gonna be required by CDC guidance and required by the state, uh, it's, it's gonna destroy our budgets. Um, and so hoping for the magic fair, I, I sincerely hope for the magic fairies, but, but hope is not a plan. And um, I don't know enough about the CARES Act um, amounts in our own individual towns and how they relate to the figures just mentioned, um, but I do know enough to say um, that uh, there are districts that have already said very directly that they are not going to have enough money to pay even for the PPE, even for the stuff that Ms. Consolino just mentioned, um, to say nothing of additional staffing and transportation. Uh, and so, um, you know, in discussion, this was really a grassroots effort. The, the, the petition that is circulating 
among school committees. It's it's under my email address, but it had to be under somebody's. So, uh, I but I just sort of pulled the ideas together and the thinking about how to focus this particular resolution was to make it as simple as possible so that it had as much broad support among school committees as possible. We 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 could have gone the, the three page route like we did with the federal funding uh, resolution that got into all the details, but this just really boils it down to uh, if if you know if it's our responsibility to open schools in a a safe uh, and equitable manner. Uh, and it's the state's responsibility to make sure that we have the funds available to do things that they're requiring us to do. And so therefore, they need to guarantee reimbursement of that. Um, and, you know, we understand that the state has its own fiscal crisis. Uh, I don't think anybody denies that. But, um, the, you know, the feeling expressed here is that school committees need to have some unity and some solidarity at the beginning you know, of, of this fiscal crisis, right? Because we've all talked about this fiscal crisis is going to last a long time. And uh, if school districts don't early and clearly state that we're not going to allow it to eviscerate our budgets and in an inequitable fashion across the state, then we need to take a stand and we need to do it in a unified way. And so that's that's what this is about. Um, so it's you know I'm happy to say it's gotten some positive response so far. Um, so this was cir started circulating Monday. Um, it's Thursday now and. Um, if, if our three committees pass it tonight, that'll be 11 school committees so far. It's pretty good for four days. There's another 20 or so that have already said it's on their agendas in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's the beginning of a statement, but, but it's, it's a clear articulation um, to raise public awareness that, that we, need to, we need to really put a fine point on, on defending our budgets and doing it so in an equitable manner. Dr. Morris. Yeah, I'd just like to, from my vantage point, speak in support of, of Mr. what Mr. Demling wrote. I also, you know, just want to note that we still don't know at all what our Chapter 70 budget will look like, which is education funding. We have no idea what fiscal shape we'll be in, you know, much like many other districts in the area. We've taken, you know, we did, as you know, at the regional level, we have $300,000 to account for cuts in state funding. Uh, we've been conservative in filling vacancies. We did not go the route of riffing dozens of staff members you've seen, you may have seen some districts do that in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and so, you know, I just think when there's such uncertainty on the state budget, and I think Mr. Demling noted this, for districts then to be stuck with a, you know, we're a relatively medium sized district in Massachusetts, if we consider all three districts together. Uh, to, to, it's a significant uh, burden, financial burden absolutely needs to happen from a public health perspective. There's no critique of that, uh, but, but the uncertainty of what we're going to be dealing with when the state budget comes out, whenever that is, July, August, uh, and how to run school is significant. And I, again, I want to stress that uh, we, we have some, you know, kind of placeholder values to support us if the state budget comes in incredibly low to a certain extent. But one of the reasons we didn't riff people is we need every staff member we can have to make school work next year. It's not just because we're like uh, riding high or, or like rolling the dice. It's that I don't know how you run school with that many fewer staff members. And so I think I just wanted to add to Mr. Dimling's, I think, accurate description that this is, it's, they're not, it's, you could see it as two variables. We don't know what the state budget is and there's a need for PPE, but actually all of it's happening simultaneously. And I think that it makes the need so much more critical. So thank you for your work, Mr. Dimling. Any comments um, or questions from the committees? Mr. Menino. I read the resolution earlier today. Its brevity is its effectiveness. I endorse the resolution. Any other uh, comments or questions? Um, uh, Dr. Mars, can you stop sharing so I can <laughs> see everybody's faces? Thank you. I'm not seeing any uh, comments or questions. And this one, we actually were prepared ahead of time and we have three versions of this for each district and committee. Um, I will take a motion from uh, the region. I'm not quite sure how to say this, but I, I move that we endorse the um, Amherst Pella, the resolution, um, I'm not sure of the wording. 
open to wording help here. Um, I think if you just say the, the add the what the resolution was for for state funding, I think. Okay. So I motioned that we um, endorse the uh, COVID state funding resolution. A second. Moved by Seeger, seconded by Spitzer. Um, we will move to a roll. Oh, any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to roll call vote. Mr. Menino? Menino, why? Mr. Harrington? Harrington, I. Mr. Demling? Demling, I. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. Mr. Stancer? I uh, Ms. Stancer, sir. <laughs> Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, I. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. And McDonald, I. And so the resolution passes nine to zero. And I'll make a motion for the Amherst School Committee. I move that we um, endorse the a uh, resolution in support of state additional state funding to support COVID-19 supplies. I second, Lord second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, I. Mr. Demling? Demling, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. And McDonald, I. It passes. Uh, the resolution passes five to zero, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Hall. All right, thank you, and um, thanks very much, Peter, for spearheading this and letting me take all the language. So I will entertain a motion from Pelham School Committee. Um, I move that we endorse the resolution for state funding just in support of COVID-19. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second? Second. Oh, that was you, Jesse. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? No? Okay. Um, Ron, go ahead. Manina, why? Sarah Best? Kenny, I. Jesse? Jean Louis, I. Margaret? Stancer, I. And Hall, I. Great. Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, so thank you. Um, and I just a quick comment. If uh, anyone else here sits on other school committees that aren't represented here, or if you are friends, colleagues with other school committees, um, if you want to just send this to them, um, you know, numbers here is, is going to help visibility. Uh, if this becomes a critical mass thing, then, then it hits the, sort of the next level of news cycle and it, it impacts there. So um, anything we can do to spread the word is good. Okay, so, so moving on to our next um, item is uh, survey results. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Yep, I'll try to mirror Ms. Contalino's brevity uh, in describing very complex uh, things. So uh, I put a slideshow together, Just it just has the raw data and I'll be able to speak to some disaggregations I did. Um, it's a 160 some odd page document because of the qualitative data. It's incredibly interesting to read through. Um, I tried my best to come up with themes. I'll speak to a couple of the qualitative data a little later, but this present the, the slides are really just looking at the quantitative data. And the reason I put it on a separate slide deck is because there's so many pages of qualitative data. Sometimes it was, I found myself going back and putting little post-it notes on the pages with the quantitative data and then having to you know go back and forth. So I thought it might be easier. So see if I can do this more effectively than earlier. Okay. Uh, can folks see that? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. So there we go. So we got 880 responses. Uh, we did a lot of broad outreach. Um, I want to thank uh, publicly Dr. Guevara, who contacted many families um, and you know who who might have needed support in accessing the survey. And we allowed for uh, hand entering of uh, you know our staff to hand enter 
data that was received, as well as Ms. Richardson, who did a lot of outreach with ELL families. Um, the first question was just simply a demographic of who was responding to the survey. Uh, you could see that the primary groups were parent guardians. You'll notice that the number is over 100%, and that's because we have a significant number of respondents who are both uh, staff members in the district as well as have children in the district. So you might have been wondered why that data came out the way it did, and, and that is why the percents came out uh, looking a little funny uh, for people who are used to those percentages usually adding up to 100%. Uh, by the way, since I can't see anyone, if there's questions throughout, please slow me down and stop me um, if there's any clarifying uh, pieces of information. Uh, we did send this out or did reach out to Leverett and Shootsbury to uh, encourage their sixth grade students or families of sixth grade students in those districts uh, to be able to um, participate in this survey as well. The second question asked if safety plans are in place based on guidance from, you know, uh, officials, do you believe students should return? Uh, I was really pleasantly surprised, I'll be honest, with the number of about 82% of respondents um, suggesting that we should. That's well above some of the national polling that I've seen. And I think it confirms that while we've taken a lot of conservative, what I feel like are conservative measures or strong measures around safety, uh, hopefully that's inspired some confidence that our next steps uh, collectively as an organization will, will retain those. Um, I will say that there was a bit of a difference between staff and families. Um, so staff was a little lower. Again, it was, it was about 75%. Uh, families was a little higher than that, and it averaged out to about 82%, but a significant majority uh, feeling that uh, if we take those safety measures, um, that students should be back in school in the fall. The third question was one with a lot of qualitative data. Again, I'll try to summarize that my best, <laughs> best I can a little later. The fourth question was about the hybrid model. So just as a review, the hybrid model involves all students coming to school for some days and, and um, having some form of distance learning on other days. And this question tried to ascertain whether uh, kind of a two days a week model where one group of students perhaps would come on Monday and Tuesday, another group would come on Thursday or fri and Friday, uh, were preferable as opposed to uh, having groups of students come in person four days, four days one week and the next week a different set of four days. Uh, you could see about three to one, uh, the respondents prefer the two days a week. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal data, uh, qualitative data as to why some of that's about work schedules for, for different uh, people. Some was just the, the concern that four days a week would leave a too large a gap from a learning perspective. Uh, staff was a little more split on this. They still preferred two days a week. Uh, the respondents who were staff members still preferred two days a week, but not by the same margin. Uh, it was much more about 55-45. Uh, for staff. Um, so um, we have a, a question from Mr. Menino. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. How would the um, hybrid model work? A teacher is in the classroom four days a week. When are they? When are they preparing the online portion? Are we expecting them to teach seven days a week? So that gets to a great question. And if Mr. Mir, if you could hold till the end of the presentation, uh, I'd like to address that more directly. Um, okay. but just on, me. No, no, you're spot on. Cause I think the way you do a hybrid model will determine the quality of the uh, distance learning. I think it's a critical point. Um, so I'd love to loop back to that at the end, if that's okay with you. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, and, and I had these as graphs, and actually they were more confusing as graphs uh, because uh, the wording than, so sorry for looking at all the numbers, but um, the visuals actually I found didn't help with the charts. Um, so that's why I just had the data tables. So the fifth question was um, what challenges would be created? And, and so you see uh, near, nearly half uh, the respondents indicated that childcare and distance learning days would be a major concern. Um, Ability to return to employment was not not surprisingly pretty tied to that same or similar number, and ability to provide assistance for my child for distance learning was was about two thirds of respondents suggested that. Uh, the staff numbers were very similar. Uh, I do want to note that when the staff numbers are similar about returning to ability to return to employment, that's a major caution for me. Uh, you know, while I deeply am concerned about families' ability to return to employment, if our staff members are unable to return to employment. Um, the whole operation doesn't work. And so we are actively thinking, uh, taking that question seriously and trying to consider what are alternatives 
could we look at? Could we provide childcare for staff members uh, for their children? Um, Again, not all of our staff members' children attend one of our districts. So uh, that was an eye-popping number, 43%. Uh, and again, for staff members, it's pretty similar to that number. And so that is something that we have to take into account for our planning, both for the community, but, but also in particular for our staff members who we're relying on to, uh, to educate children. Question six was a qualitative data uh, asking about uh, elementary um, students where elementary students are um, prioritized uh, in terms of having more in-class instruction. So question seven asked, uh, what's the minimum amount of in-person instruction needed for middle school students? Uh, I wanna just be clear that choices were one, two, or none. There wasn't a three, four, or five days a week because I don't see those as viable options right now. Uh, for secondary school students, you could see uh, about three quarters of respondents uh, suggested two days a week uh, would be the minimum number of days. And staff, the staff, when I disaggregated for staff members, it was the same. I think it's worth noting when we talk about uh, when I disaggregated for students with special needs, uh, parents of students with special needs, excuse me, uh, these numbers were higher in terms of the two days a week as a minimum, um, that there was a distinction and, and a little bit of a distinction of the ELL students, although the, the end size of the EL, parents of ELL students was, was relatively small. Uh, question eight asked uh, the same question, but for high school students, and you see similar data, but not quite as high, you know, so 63 compared to, you know, about 73, uh, feeling like two days a week is, um, is needed. Uh, the staff numbers were similar, but actually a little bit uh, less. Uh, so only 56% uh, were advocating at least for uh, a minimum of two days a week, as opposed to about 64% um, all aggregated. And so the family number is a little higher than that. Question nine, uh, if implemented, uh, what challenges uh, would this model present? Uh, you could see a pretty significant drop in the childcare needs, ability to return to employment, significantly lower than the hybrid model, uh, and, and even a little bit of reduction in terms of the ability to provide assistance during distance learning. And, and that's the end of the, the qualitative or the quantitative data. Um, so let me stop sharing and go back to this screen. I think as it relates to qualitative um, data, um, it was all over the map, is a short story. There was, a, a, and if those of you reading are nodding your head, so there was a lot of concern about uh, everyone wanting more in-time school for their students, uh, whether that's coming from a staff member or coming from a parent, which I think all of us would endorse uh, in a perfect world. We'd wanna get students in as much as, as we could. And I think, you know, when you disaggregate the data for secondary versus elementary, you have some predictable trends that emerge that um, for, for parents of elementary students thinking of childcare needs, thinking of uh, how distancing with learning is when, particularly for primary grade students, uh, is critical. When you think about secondary students, there's a lot of concerns about maintaining social connections as well as academics. Uh, I want to address Mr. Medino's point because I think it's really important. Um, so I'm going to restate it in my own terms, Mr. Medino, and if it's, if it's, Different than what you were suggesting, please stop me. Um, so the question is under some hybrid models where, uh, for instance, you can imagine middle school students coming in two days a week, it might be group A comes in Monday, Tuesday, and group B comes in Thursday, Friday. Uh, one of the concerns that was expressed, and I think it's accurate is, well, those teachers are teaching four days a week. Uh, so they're not gonna be accessible for live kind of Zoom calls, things like that, or Google Meets on the days they're working with different sets of students. And Wednesdays are really would be designed both for cleaning, but for staff members for professional development, as well as for planning some asynchronous types of activities. But one of the things that we know we've heard from our community is maintaining those social connections is really critical. Uh, I've taken that feedback incredibly seriously. I think when we come back maybe two weeks from now, uh, I'm trying to develop models that perhaps um, would not have teachers uh, involved in hybrid models uh, teaching direct students directly uh, four days a week. Because uh, I do think that's gonna be a really hard model from a distance learning standpoint to be satisfactory. Um, so I don't have all that fleshed out. It's still in the kind of working out phases. But I think you know your point is really well taken because I think there's some assumption that uh, teachers would be able to do both simultaneously, right? <laughs> and I think you probably, I nodded, saw you nodding your head before. It looks like you really read the long document and saw some of the feedback. and. And the reality is if there's an A group Monday, Tuesday and a B group Thursday, Friday, 
there's no way for teachers to be managing both. Uh, we need as many hands on deck, so to speak, to cover classrooms that all have 10 to 15 students as possible. And so I think you really are hitting on a central point that uh, if there are ways to have, if there are models where staff members aren't doing that, that's gonna enhance the distance, the quality of the distance learning uh, immeasurably. And so we are trying to take that feed. It's been one of the critical, the reason I'm harping on your point, because I think it's a critical piece of feedback that uh, if we are gonna have some distance learning going on, which we assuredly will, uh, we wanna develop models where that can be the highest quality possible. And then you balance that with the in-class piece and it's a complex Tetris board to try to solve. And we are actively trying to develop models. And I think we're making some inroad, uh, inroads, I should say, to, to think deeply about that. Because what we don't want to do is promise the community that we can be effective uh, in the model you, sh you shared. Uh, and I think having the reality to be something less satisfying, particularly on the distance learning days. Um, so I'm really glad you raised that point because it's something that uh, was screaming at me as I was reading through the data about making sure that we can be clear about what we can and can't do. Uh, and, you know, we're sitting in on a lot of these working groups. There's a real commitment from staff to, to increasing the quality of what we're doing to being more thoughtful on the distance learning piece uh, and collaborating more with staff so that we're able to differentiate for different groups of students and make those firmer connections than may have been possible this spring when we did it on a dime. Uh, but we can't do that if teachers are in front of students that much of the time, right? There's not the critical mass of teachers won't be there to, to do that. And so uh, that's why I, I'm being long-winded in my response, but I, I don't think I can understate your point because I think it's so apt. Uh, my point is, I, I appreciate your concern, but my point is I've attended the third grade class uh, distance learning all semester this year. And um, uh, Ms. Sarah LaPlante, uh, D does a good job, but she couldn't do that job if she was in the classroom four days a week. Right. Uh, so this basically says, well, I don't know what your plan for imagining a different way of delivering the distance learning is. I look forward to it. Uh, are you going to clone teachers or something like that? I don't know. Right. And, and, and to the point, I just want to stress the other side of it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Menino. It really is a concern because I, it, I, I taught uh, distance learning, but it was asynchronous. It wasn't right. synchronous. Are you going to make it? Maybe that's a way of doing it. Uh, it all the online is um, is asynchronous. Right, which is, I think, broadly unsatisfactory to many families who, who really oh, it's terrible. have a mix of that. I think the other point is, you know, for people who are saying, because I read a couple of comments and it's a reasonable thing, could half the teachers be there and half the teachers do the asynchronous part, that won't work with class sizes that we're talking about. We need as, uh, we really need as full complement of staff to be in person to cover the days when students are there uh, because the class sizes are gonna be so reduced. So it doesn't really work unless we were doubling the size of our staff to have yeah. half staff in and half staff doing distance. Um, so I, I think we're, I, you know, I, I'm opti cautiously optimistic that we're looking at some models uh, that takes that point into account. And I'll be honest that I didn't think all of that through, and that's why you do a survey, right? We did. This was a gestalt survey to try to get an overview of where people were at a certain moment in time. And I got a lot from the response. I read every single response. Uh, I got a tremendous amount from the responses, and it's making my team, uh, all of us, think a little differently about how to make this feasible and effective uh, for instructing our students. So um, I'm glad you picked up the same thing that we picked up. Thank you. Um, I saw uh, Mr. Demling's hand and then Ms. Spitzer's hand. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the point about the, the wide variance of passionate and well-articulated responses in the survey, I don't think it could be understated. It's, it's really amazing. Um, and it's not just a couple people here, but most people over there. It's, it, it really drove home for me that, you know, there is no solution here where there are not going to be a large number of people who are pretty unhappy that things didn't go how they felt initially. And so I feel like um, when we choose A or B for a lot of these variables, we really need to be um, ensuring that, 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 that B is as good as it can be. You know, to, to your point about um, making distance learning uh, a higher quality level, than even what it was um, in distance learning. You know, we need to th be thinking about upgrading to distance learning 3.0. <laughs> and what does that mean? 
Um, I, I think um, you may have mentioned this, um, if this is what you meant, but having teachers doing exclusive um, online learning, I think sounds like a great idea. Um, you know, we had the, the very first um, question that you showed on the survey uh, that 18% uh, of families, even if we're following all recommended safety guidelines, 154 responses, still wouldn't be feel okay sending their kids back. That That's not a small number. <laughs> it's not a, a small number of parents um, if, if we go with one of these models. And so, you know, the possibility of, you know, could we make it that there's an option if you're if a parent says, I, great for your model, but my, I want my kid to be online 100% uh, of the time. Can, can we support that? I think that's something we need to um, consider. Um, but um, but yeah, so I, th I think I think focusing on on um, articulating as soon as possible what what distance learning looks like, at, especially at the older the older grades um, when it might be more the majority of their learning what that looks like. Um, and, and, you know, also getting some feedback from the students. We've talked about getting student feedback. Uh, you know, we haven't seen that so far. Um, I think that would be, that would be great if before, you know, students leave, if we could, if we could gather that and say, you know, what, what were the stumbling blocks for you? What really, you know, was, was, was kind of bothersome to you about your learning experience? So that if you're going to be doing this three or four days a week, we can make it as, 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 as excellent as, as it possibly can be. Yeah. If I could just respond to that briefly. Um, so one is that survey will go out early next week. We're just finalizing it right now. We're using uh, Wellesley had a pretty good example. We got some feedback from the distance learning working group that's looking at fall um, uh, today, uh, yesterday and today. So we'll be finalizing that tomorrow, uh, getting it translated and having that go out to all families, uh, all secondary students and all staff people, uh, staff members. Um, so we'll get that additional feedback lens uh, from that as you suggested. I think the, the other piece that uh, I think is worth stressing is there was, um, in the qualitative feedback, there was a real desire for every student in the district to have some in-person education, right? There was varying levels of what people felt like was sufficient, not sufficient, but the idea of any student being all virtual, uh, I think may be a non-starter uh, for, for a great number of people in the community. And that's another piece of feedback that, again, that's why we did a survey relatively early on before we had DESE guidance, we just had some uh, kind of broad options uh, because I think that's something that we wanted to see where people were on. And I think there was overwhelming clarity on that particular point. And so um, I didn't say that earlier, but Mr. Demling's comment um, reminded me that I think it's important to say that out loud. And right, we could have some disagreement about how much and where to emphasize, but the idea of all virtual, um, I think is, uh, is as close to a non-starter as, as, um, as we have on this. Um, Ms. Spitzer and then Ms. Stancer. All right. Great. So um, I have a few questions. I'm going to start with um, question two, where um, we were asking about whether or not schools should be open. And I think we should point out that that's a slightly different question than whether or not if schools are open, will you send your child? And I think that sometimes we've been kind of um, mixing the two and I could see somebody saying, yes, school should be open, but I personally will make the decision not to send my kid to school or none of these options look good and, and therefore I'm not gonna accept them. So I don't know if, um, I mean, uh, I think clearly like you, you put a lot of thought into the survey and that's probably the question you wanted to ask, but I, I think it's just important to highlight that it could be very different. Um, Looks like you want to respond, sorry. Yeah, so I think we asked, you're right, we asked it intentionally. We didn't want to ask families a question until we had a specific model that we were closer to proposing because we felt like it was an unfair question. Um, so, right, there may be, and even some of this came out in the qualitative data. Some people were like, well, I really like the one week on, one week off, and people, some people felt safer in that model. Other people felt differently about that. There were some questions about PPE. And so until we had some more clarity on that. We didn't want to ask people a question that they would not fairly not be able to answer because it's dependent on other items. Uh, I do think I agree with what Ms. Spitzer said. I also think the opposite's true. It may be families who say, well, if it was up to me, I wouldn't want school to open, but given that other kids are coming back and that's going to be by far and away the best form of education my kid receives, I may feel comfortable. So I think it's it's proxy. It's not exact proxy. And I don't think the correlation is 100%. Uh, I was still surprised to see the number at that level. 
Um, and again, pleasantly surprised. I, I, but I like that the number's high, higher than I would have guessed. Um, but, but I think you're right. We, we did not ask, would you send your child back? And I think as we develop models and get more feedback from the community, we're going to have to get much more um, direct in our questioning on that and the transportation question uh, and some other questions. But for our first glance survey, um, we, we didn't want to put anyone in the spot where they'd be answering that direct question without more information. And I guess um, I'm, I'm just offering some um, feedback on the survey as somebody who's done a little survey design. So feel free to take some of it or leave it. But I found it, um, and I, again, I'm assuming these are all really intentional, but we, we had this conversation about may, wanting to make sure that we were reaching certain communities, but we didn't have any, we had one question about if somebody was an ELL learner and one question about whether or not um, they had um, a child with an IEP, I believe. I forget the exact wording. But I'm wondering if we want to be a little bit more, and maybe it's a privacy issue and we don't want to be collecting this type of data, um, but it seems like it would be useful to try to see like who are we reaching with these surveys a little bit and, and be able to profile a little. And then if we aren't reaching, say, certain communities, we'd want to then follow up and do maybe phone calls or more outreach. It sounds, I'm really happy to hear that it sounds like the Family Center was doing some of that, and that's excellent. And then the other thing is um, thinking not just about accessibility of the surveys that are sending out, but also I was really surprised to see like the highest category was ability to provide assistance to my child during distance learning. And I'd like to drill down into that a little bit more. So we've been thinking about distance learning and the accessibility of the kids, but we haven't really been thinking about what are the parents coming to it with in terms of, um, you know, do they have any, um, any issues themselves that might make it difficult for them to access the distance learning. And since parents are going to be partnering, I think we need to know something about the parents' ability. And maybe this has been happening already, but um, I know we've been doing some outreach to try and touch base with students who aren't showing up and that, that hopefully that's um, unearthing some issues that might be um, on the parents' side. But I think um, as we go into next year, it would be really good to do some surveys of parents and find out what their challenges are with accessing some of these technologies and if we need to do things like having captioning or you know th things that will make our distance learning more accessible and I think we were kind of building the plane as we were flying at this mark but to the extent that we have time over the summer to think about that um, and then the only kind of other really nitty nitpicky thing is that I noticed that we had two separate links for the survey, one in Spanish and one in English when he took it, but then but then it opened up and it was all the English and the Spanish were on top of each other. And I personally found that kind of hard to read. And I'm wondering if we're if what the thinking is with putting them together, if we are actually providing separate links. And I think it's great we're translating it, but is that is there a reason to put both the English and the Spanish in the same documents or could it ease some of the burden on the survey reader? by doing it just in English or just in Spanish. So that's it. Yeah, so I'll just, if I could comment just briefly, I think the distance learning survey that I mentioned is coming out next week gets at some of the questions you uh, get at in terms of families. We struck, I struggle, I'll just say myself, I struggle with what level of demographic data to collect. Uh, personally, I'd like to collect a lot more. I know the privacy piece gets a little complicated perhaps um, for some folks. Um, about asking more demographic data. The researcher side of me really likes if we could somehow anonymize it, but capture uh, very intentional demographic data. Um, at the same time, I think the civil liberties piece gets a little complicated, right? If we're, we're identifying um, what we identify, it can get, uh, we've gotten some negative feedback when we've, add, we've added questions that captured more demographic data. Even when we said, click all that apply or optional question, uh, so, you know, I'd love to think with you about it because I know you have a lot of background in that, uh, perhaps offline. Um, I think to the last point you made, um, oh, now I'm losing track of the last point you made. Can you remind me of that, Ms. Spitzer? Sorry. Um, I made a point about having the English and Spanish right next okay. to each other instead of creating two separate links. Yeah. So the links that were there were links to the presentation in English and Spanish. It was the same Survey Monkey link, but it was... Uh, for people who wanted to view the presentation, we had the tra presentation translated, which is a suggestion of the committee and a good one. Um, what we found is, first of all, merging the data gets a bit messy uh, when you have two different um, 
survey links and um, the other feedback we received from the Spanish speaking community in particular is that um, when they receive an email in English and, and then it's translated to Spanish and goes to a different link, um, it's not quantitative data, but qualitatively, it, it doesn't feel great. Um, and I know that we could say we're offering the same survey, but um, it, you know we've gotten feedback that actually there's positive feedback that everyone's taking the same survey and that feels better uh, to the communities as having like a Spanish language only survey. But I think in readability, it's a question. I think to the first point you made about overall readability, it's interesting because one of the things that we received, this was a relatively brief survey in terms of the, the data is huge, but the actual survey was relatively brief. And there was some desire to actually make it even smaller, like that 11 questions or 12 questions was too many and just being cautious of the wording. And I think when we're trying to hit a, a very broad demographic, it does make a challenge about what's accessible, what's too long, what's too short. Um, but again, I, I think uh, not that anyone who offers a critique is then responsible for partnering. <laughs> I don't want to set that dynamic, but but I, I would love to have you know an external person. I know you have a lot of background in it next time around to to help think through some of these thornier issues. I just want to say I'd be happy to connect offline. And then the other thing is that you have to think about a lot of people. I think are taking this on their smartphone. Yeah. And that's the other reason that I find like if, if there's a lot of text, it can be really hard to, and people might shy away from doing it. Yeah. Um, Ms. Stancer, you had a question earlier. Um, well, I, I have some comments and maybe a couple of questions. So, um, you know, this is completely, atypical for responses to surveys to get this much. When I opened the document and saw 169 pages, I was like, oh my God. Um, I did not read everything, but I tried to read a pretty good portion of the comments. And a couple of things that stood out for me, um, there it seemed to me there were parents or people resp responding perceived an inconsistency in um, the presentation of the distance material. Some people indicated that they found Google Meets was very awkward, um, very hard to navigate even for the adults, let alone for the children, um, which lead me to the question because several people mentioned Moodle, which I know about from my previous job. Um, and I wondered, are we locked into a Google for what we're doing? Um, another thing, um, there seemed to be perceived that there was inconsistency in the amount of in-person time that students received and also of expectations about what they were going to do. And um, I, I wondered if what kind of training may be provided for the the teachers, you know, you don't just go from teaching in front of people to teaching online, you know, it's a completely different way of thinking about what you're doing. And it seems to me if we want this to be really successful, we're really going to have to provide some or more assistance to our instructors. Um, see, I I did note that a lot of people mentioned the special ed and ELL students needing to have in person, even if that was not someone in their family. It seemed to me like it was mentioned by many people, perhaps not just the people who had students in those categories. Um, and I would like to have seen the, the teacher comments separate from the parent guardian comments because you didn't know necessarily, there were a few that it was easy to tell it was a teacher, but for the most part, it was very difficult to know. And, and I just would have been interested in the observations of the teachers versus the parent guardians. So that's just my thoughts. Dr. Morris. I took notes, so I got all yours down. I should have done that for Ms. Spitzer. Um, so in terms of Google Meets, um, it's not not settled. I mean, we did purchase inexpensive Zoom uh, accounts. Um, we did have a lot of concerns about safety and security, uh, number of districts, New York City being one, 
uh, banned Zoom because of, um, and there were numerous Zoom bombing incidents in, in our Commonwealth, including a horrific one on the Eastern part of the state with a bunch of racist dialogue. Um, and so uh, in the fall, maybe Zoom will have solved those problems, but, um, and we do have some teachers using the accounts we set up for Zoom, but we really were supporting Google Meets. Google's also pouring tremendous amount of, of resources into improving Google Meets, like starting next week, um, the sound quality is going to be uh, much better than on any other system. They're, they've developed a technology to reduce background noise, uh, which is a, a big issue in any video conferencing. Um, but we're not, we're not, you know, that's not a settled question. Um, I think the in-person time, I think that's right. I think uh, we, we had some inconsistencies. Uh, I think that's an accurate piece of feedback. We got that in the distance learning survey that we had the first time as well. And I, I know from being on both distance learning committees that there's a commitment to making sure that that's much more consistent, organized, and equitable moving forward. The expectations piece is one that everybody agrees with, parents, students, everyone. Uh, I was in a meeting today, actually this morning, with uh, the elementary, a subgroup of the elementary distance learning. And an elementary teacher said, I completely agreed with the DESE guidance at the beginning that this work was encouraged, it was enrichment, but if we're doing any of this in the fall, um, I'm taking attendance and, uh, and we need, you know, I wanna be accountable to my students and I need my students to be accountable to me. And uh, this is not someone coming from, in my opinion, from a negative place about students, it's someone who's seeing the impact of having, you know, two thirds or three quarters of her class active on and, and accessing the curriculum and it's going very well and having those students who aren't and what they're missing. So uh, I do think uh, K to 12 in both of those groups, there's really a lot of clarity about setting expectations uh, and problem solving, you know, if there are remaining technology issues for families, but uh, not in continuing the sort of looser model that we've had this spring. Uh, I think the last one, yeah, I'll, I'll send along just the teacher comments, uh, disaggregated, and I'll send those along to you tomorrow, to the, to the committees. Great. Um, I just, one comment anecdotally, I have heard concern from teachers about the students who have not been participating being the students who most need to be participating. So there's what seems to be a lot of concern about that. Right. And we've heard it from parents, too, who don't want to argue with their children about when the children say, I don't have to do it. It's just encouraged. Uh, it's actually created. Well, I think it came from an empathetic place from Desi. It's actually created a fair bit of tension. And we've heard that from families who are don't have a great retort when a student says it's encouraged, not required. Uh, and we actually want to reduce any tension between children and families during this time in particular. And, and I think, well, again, well-intentioned, I think it's actually some families it's contributed to tension. Um, they would much rather the school take a little bit of a firmer stance that attendance is required, that this is schoolwork, that there's some version of grading. Uh, and I think, you know, in fairness to the state, when this all started, we didn't know how long it was going to last. It was two weeks. And as it grew, it was hard to reverse course once you're down a path. And I think the summer is a big reset for us. Um, I don't know if it's happening for other folks, but uh, Google Meet is doing a very funky thing this evening that only the speaker is in motion and everybody else is frozen. Um, but as soon as they, somebody else starts speaking, they start moving. So I apologize if I haven't seen raised hands, but you're all frozen in various interesting poses on my screen. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we're not broadcasting from my 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 screen. <laughs> um, so I want I um, have just a few um, comments slash questions because um, I didn't see any other hands raised. So I'll um, ask mine. But um, one of the things just to echo, I think what a few other people I read probably about five or 600 of the, <laughs> the responses. <laughs> um, and, and they, and they, you know, at the same time that they're all, you know, everyone, there's no sort of my, my sort of sense is you can't sort of bucket them and say the majority of the people said this, or the majority of respondents said that. Um, but there are some very strong themes like that are in there. And I think Dr. Morris, you um, mentioned them um, or alluded to them earlier. So is that everybody, um, everybody is wants some, some in-person learning. Everybody agrees that everybody also agrees that none of these options are as good as what they, you know, as close to, you know, what we had before, before pandemic. And, and there's a real sense of loss, I think, coming through everybody's comments in that is that, you know, just that sort of um, 
mourning that uh, we can't we can't be back to where we were um, before March, and I and that came through loud and clear, at least for me as I was reading it. And I think everybody agreed. Um, nobody wants exclusively online learning. I think several folks have said that nobody wants their students, their children, to be um, only on um, doing distance learning next year. Um, but then between those two bands, it's it's really um, uh, wide ranging. Somebody asked the question about sort of parents having trouble accessing it. And I've had a few converse, like direct conversations with people in the community over the last week or so, um, specifically on that comment. And it is interesting. I, I think we, we tend to assume um, a, a lot about sort of just basic technologies and how you know, just like how do you do how do you find out how do you how do you ask for help if you can't if you're not getting a response or how do you ask for help if you can't figure out how to submit this assignment in this particular way and um i think you know one of the the takeaways so it's not just it's not just the technology help and it's also there's also pieces of um, you know, my math learning didn't go all the way up. I can't help my high school student, middle school student um, in math. Um, there were several comments about that in the in the survey as well. But you also hear that from other folks is that you know my students' learning and and coursework is beyond sort of my recollection or you know my schooling. Um, but even but I think you know there's some amount of when whatever distance learning we have, there is some amount of um, just basic how-to guides that we'll we'll want to be preparing for students and parents as to here's what here's how it's going to roll here's what's going to happen here's what you do if you have a question here here's what you do if you have a question there or if you can't um, if you're not hearing X Y Z from your school um, that isn't that's beyond sort of what we normally do to help families and students adjust to a new school year. Um, I think, you know, also building on, um, I think uh, Mr. Menino may have said this, but um, making sure that we have options for families that don't want to send their children um, back to school in person. So whether that be enabling folks to opt in for distance only, um, even though I said that most people, most everybody agrees they don't want exclusively distance, but making sure that the folks that still are not comfortable um, sending their, their students back to school to in-person learning, that they have an option, whether it's distance learning or taking you know, a gap year, for example, if they're later in high school and wanna just repeat the year later. Um, I, I think that will be really important to mapping out um, the start of the school year. So that's um, my, uh, I'm just looking to see if I had other notes here. Um, I, I think the other thing that I noticed too is a lot of people were comparing as the the two options, comparing it back to either the current distance learning or or our pre pandemic in person learning. And I think what you know, as as we think through and and sort of building on Mr. Menino's observation that if you're doing a hybrid model, you're in you, you know teachers are teaching four days a week. Your in person is going to be very very different, not just because we're going to have 10 person or 15 person classrooms, um, but also just the way school is going to be taught or experienced um, in, you know, given all of the PPE and everything that's happening. So it's not what, whatever we, whatever model we end up with school, whether it's in person or distance is going to look very, very different than what we experienced this year. Um, Dr. Morris. Sorry, that just that also made me think. Uh, one of the questions that's uh, that I've gotten uh, some by email, so it's not all in the survey, is what if a vaccine's here in November or December? And so that's something particularly at the secondary level that we have to think through. Because if we're thinking of a different model or a different schedule for secondary students, and I don't mean number of days a week, but literally a different schedule, um, how many courses students take at a time or how long it is, we have to to also plan for that there's some commitment that gets made. If you're taking fewer courses at a time and in January, everyone's got a vaccine and we're all back in school full time, we have to figure out that out. And I know at the secondary level, we're having active conversations on administrative team of you know, what would make sense given CDC guidance. Uh, and then what would it look like if uh, we're in a different place for second semester? Uh, how would we finish the year? Uh, and I don't, again, I don't mean literally finish the year because I think great, we're in school more often, things are returning to normal, uh, or 
whatever that means. Um, but it's uh, it's also that there, whatever you, system you set up in the fall has to be continued at the secondary level, just the nature of secondary school. Um, so that's an additional wrinkle that um, has to be thought about in all of our models um, as we think about middle school and particularly at the high school. Because the middle school with the team model is a little easier to manage with that one. The high school is a unique bear uh, as it relates to that. So just another um, variable that we are actively thinking about that came through in a couple of the comments in the survey about, you know, and emails I've gotten about what happens when a vaccine comes and how far down are you a road, how far down a road are you where you can't undo what you've done. So uh, we want to have sustainability and durability for whatever the model is. Um, Cause you know, I tend to be a pessimistic person about those kind of things, but some people I know who are more knowledgeable seem to be showing more optimism. Um, and so we don't want to set up a model that's um, can't be reversed or uh, won't work when we go back to a five day a week, full day model. Just another variable. There's a lot of them, sorry, but that's another one. <laughs> Are there any other comments um, from the committees? Questions? Dr. Morris? So I'd just say in terms of next steps, uh, what I imagine we have, a, I think, hopefully a relatively brief Amherst School Committee meeting next week, um, which actually we have to get that agenda done and posted tomorrow now that I think about it. Um, and uh, well, originally, I'll find out more tomorrow. I have a conference call. Superintendents have a conference call with the commissioner. I think originally the, the guidance was slated to come out next week. An email I got this week said in the next week or two. So I'm not sure when uh, what that means. Um, but, you know, I think we should try to plan for meeting not next week, but the week after whether guidance comes or not. Um, because I think, I think at that point we'll have clarified what our real options are. Um, at least, you know, dependent on transportation um, and staffing. Those are two variables it's hard to, to totally figure out right now. Um, but I think we can have a more informed conversation given the feedback we received and some of the dialogue tonight. Um, so I think we are scheduled to have a regional meeting that week. Um, and so I'll work with the regional chair and the, and the Pelham chair because I, I do think it makes sense to think about this, uh, all three districts at once. Um, but um, I think for me, that'll be probably the next step and let people get done with school next week and celebrate Juneteenth and uh, come back the week after to, for a more robust conversation uh, with some potential options and maybe talking about uh, continued outreach into our community. Great. Um, on that topic, also on the continued outreach, I don't know, um, one of the things, um, I, and, and it probably, we're, really late now we're moving on to two and a half hours here so i think um i, I think we'll table uh i we had talked about sort of segueing into sort of more about sort of community outreach and community and information and how do we um continue to inform um our communities about um what we're what we've been talking about um so maybe dr morris instead of sh going through that overview powerpoint we, oh. we can email it to the committee mm -hmm. uh, committees um, and uh, include it in as part of our conversation um, two weeks from now. I think that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Great. Mr. Demling. Um, just a thought. Um, I assume that, that the survey results you shared with us are, are public now. They were part of the packet. Is that okay? Um, if, if that could get emailed out in the um, the, the weekly ARPS update this Friday, I think people will be really interested, um, even those who maybe didn't participate in the survey, um, not just to see the um, the top level aggregate, but to see the, that wide variance of uh, qualitative responses and really dig in because, you know, I what, what I'm really looking for from the public now is in addition to your own lived experience and what you want the fall to look like, um, is, is to, you know, advise the school committee to some degree about now that we have this wide variance of input, you know, how do we collectively make the best decision going forward? And so I think I think having that source data as widely dispersed as possible um, would, will help people get the magnitude of the problem and, and get, get us the most effective feedback. Ms. Seeger. So I don't necessarily have a well-formed thought on this, but as I was reading through survey results today too, a thought struck me and and it was more around this problem is not just a school problem, yet, you know, um, administration, teachers, everybody's gonna be working really hard to solve this problem. 
And it's also obviously a state level problem and we've, we have a resolution about COVID funding. Um, I'm wondering too, if there's anything that we can push on at the state level um, to help families who are gonna have to deal with this. Um, it, it to, to, for the state, this is where it's not a well-formed thought. So I'm just putting it out there. But if the state were to somehow help these parents who need to go back to work, but also deal with a split schedule in school, take the pressure off by having companies, putting some pressure on companies to um, be flexible with their employees or to have some sort of subsidized childcare for those days when, you know, the kids aren't in school and the parents have to work. Um, so basically I'm just, I may be planting a seed if anyone thinks of something that we could do to help advocate for something like that at a state level. Um, that's really kind of where my thought ended, but it was just that this problem is bigger than us. And I hope it's not on us, meaning the schools and the community built around the school to solve it all. And I've, I've gotten some emails that were directly to me, not, not necessarily sent to the full school committee along that same dimension. Um, about you know, can the state you know support childcare or other other uh, other ways they can do that? Um, so you know, the other people are having similar thoughts to you as well. Ms. Spitzer, and then Ms. Lord. I share your concerns, and I unfortunately everything I've been seeing is childcare is going in the opposite direction, that we may see a contraction in the number of slots available for um, younger children, at least. So, so, I mean, I guess this is the question, right? So um, how, where, what are the levers we can pull in order to solve this problem? And I think it's unfortunate that at the time when we're gonna have the greatest need for some of these things, like funding for or the PPE and, you know, more childcare slots for parents who, who newly need them, um, those things are, are not available. So I don't have a solution, but I wanted to <laughs> just... I yes, this is um, just about the survey. I didn't understand that it would be public and I don't know if other families felt that way. So I don't know in the future, because some of it feels very um, personal and I'm, I want to be protective of that. Not that I don't trust our community at large, but I don't know if there's a way in the future to you know, suggest, suggest being more anonymous or finding ways to make it more anonymous just so that we protect our families. Yeah, and I, I, if I could respond to that, I'd love some thinking about that. I mean, our community in the past has really um, desired for survey results to be shared um, in the raw format they were. We typically uh, look for survey results and scrub anything that identifies a name, a teacher name, a student name. This was a hard one to scrub as long, but I think we got it. Um, if anyone noticed something, please let us know. Um, but I think maybe a proviso at the beginning that all responses will become, will be shared in a public document would, would perhaps uh, be more explicit about that. That's great feedback. Right, because I do, I also hold that let's be transparent, but I also hold the, this, information you might not want shared. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Jean-Louis. So along the lines of um, making sure that families in the community are representative and maybe there's, you know, employers being flexible, I think as a district that employs, um, you know, many teachers that have children that are going to be need, needing to be flexible, you know, let's keep that in mind as, as a district as well, that, um, you know, for those that have young children that are going to be on a split schedule, no matter what it may be, that let's think about how we can be flexible for those people to maintain employment. Um, specifically, if they're in different schools than you currently work in. And my other point, um, I lost it. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> no, I think it's a great point. And I think it's one of the things that I find frustrating about the state's school choice law. It's different in other states, but in, in some states, um, right now in, in Massachusetts, the only way, only uh, folks who are prioritized in the school choice list have siblings have in, in the district. Um, it has always bothered me. Um, when I was a staff member, a teacher, and didn't have kids, it just philosophically bothered me that we weren't allowed to prioritize staff members who work in the district on school choice lists. Um, that's the law. Um, I think it's um, 
unfair. Uh, I've said this before in public meetings. I think it's unfair that we're not able to prioritize staff members, uh, especially as we live in, in, in four communities that are on the more expensive side um, of uh, in Western Massachusetts. Um, so, so that's really bothered me, and um, I don't have a good solution for that. That's not changing state law, which isn't easy. Um, but I do think when we think, I mentioned before, about child care for, for staff members, um, at least offering it uh, and trying to think about how we could do that safely and, and reasonably, um, we are going down that road and trying to think about it. And I think to Ms. Seeger's point, I hate to be pessimistic again about this, but I, I do think it's going to be on the schools to solve that problem, even though I agree it's a much broader problem than what we have. And so we are trying to think about, given the survey results, how do we maximize uh, what we can uh, in terms of in-class time for elementary kids while taking that feedback. Uh, this is just my perspective. While taking the feedback that we need to get every secondary kid in the district. And so we're working on models to try to do that. Um, again, it's it's a puzzle piece. There's some some pieces missing in terms of transportation and, and staffing uh, that we have to wait and see. But that is what we're trying to find the right balance of. Um, but I, I am not optimistic about the state jumping in and offerings. There's no evidence that uh, leads me to believe that that will occur. I'll put it, that's a more appropriate way to say what I want to say. Any other comments and questions? If there's not, I just want to say I continue to work closely with, with Ms. Col Superintendent Colkeen in, in Union 28. Um, and uh, we continue to chat and text, um, including tonight. Um, and, um, you know, because we, we, I do know there's a cross section between what happens in Union 28 and, and this, these three districts as well. And not that we have to make decisions for one another, that would be inappropriate, but at least that, that line of communication continues to be open. And I want to publicly thank her for always keeping me in the loop, of things going up on uh, up in Shrewsbury and Leverett. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, it I, it seems we'll we'll talk about scheduling our next um, uh, big joint meeting um, offline, but tentatively coinciding with the um, uh, region school committee date. Okay. Um, so with that, um, I will entertain a motion from. The Amherst School Committee. Move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Spitzer. There is no discussion. Vote. Um, uh, roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. I'll turn it over to Ms. Hall. All right, I will entertain a motion to adjourn Helm School Committee meeting. So moved. moved. Go ahead. Second. All right. Uh, okay, roll call vote. Ron. Menino, aye. Jesse. John Louis, aye. Sarah Best. Kenny, aye. Margaret. Stancer, aye. And Hall, aye. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to now turn it over to Mr. Demling. Okay. As chair of the Union 26 School Committee, seeing the presence of a quorum, I will call to order the Union 26 School Committee. Uh, and before reading the following motion, uh, I will do what is required of uh, bodies meeting virtually, which is to go around and ensure that we are present and can be heard. So, um, Going to scratch my head here because it's been a few months since we have all met as Union 26. So the Union, if you are a Union 26 member, this is going to be. Um, is this Miss McDonald? Miss McDonald? I think Miss. I think Miss Spitzer is the other Amherst. Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear Miss McDonald, Miss Spitzer. Um, present. present. Okay. Uh, and then the other three members of Union 26, Miss Hall. Yes, Hall present. Uh, Mr. Menino? Menino present. And the sixth and final member of Union 26 is? <laughs> it's either Ms. Stancer or Ms. Seeger, I believe. No? 
Dr. Morris, is it possible the sixth Pelham member cycled off and we have not replaced them? I'm going to defer to the chair of Pelham here. Um, no, it's just, it's um, me, Ron, and Margaret. So, okay, so Ms. Dancer. Yes. Okay, Dancer present. Sorry, Ms. Dancer. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, now we're in the more call session. And so uh, if it's okay with the regional chair, I'll read the Union 26 motion first and then have you read yours? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I move that Union 26 enter into executive session according to Mass General Law, Section 21, Chapter 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union union personnel. Doreen Cunningham, Assistant Superintendent. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I do so declare, uh, with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Ms. McDonald. Roll call vote to enter into executive session. Uh, Ms. McDonald? McDonald, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Hall? Hall, aye. Ms. Stancer? Ms. Stancer, aye. And Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. All right, U26 is um, in executive session. Um, and for the region, um, I move that we, the region enters into executive session according to Mass General Law, Section 21, Chapter 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Doreen Cunningham, Assistant Superintendent. Um, should I continue? And and continue in exec after Union 26 adjourns with no intention of returning to open session. The region will continue an executive short session in accordance with Mass General Law Section 21, Chapter 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, UFCW, AFSCME. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I do declare with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. I second. Stancer, second. Uh, okay. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Stancer. We are now in executive session. Oh, no, we have to vote. Sorry. <laughs> um, Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Mr. Demling. Demling, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we now in executive session.